so we are about to start. Thank you all. I welcome you to the general debate. I hope you had a good night's sleep. Some of you have uh, told me that you didn't sleep at all because darkness never fell, but I do hope you could do, use your time to do something else then. Um, uh, I won't uh, go into lengthy details about the fact of, uh, about why we are having this summit, but I think we can be proud of the Council of Europe and what the Council is achieving here at this summit. Uh, I think the five roundtables provided us a unique opportunity for a very good debate on core issues and core values. I
société se transforme à un rythme accéléré, mais nos droits fondamentaux, eux, sont immuables, tout comme les conséquences de notre échec à les protéger. Il suffit pour s'en convaincre de voir ce qui se passe en Russie. S'engager aujourd'hui, c'est œuvrer pour demain. Aussi, faisons en sorte que Reykjavik reste dans les mémoires comme le lieu d'une détermination réaffirmée où la reconquête démocratique a commencé. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Maria. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Tini Cox, President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Thank you, uh, Katrin. Uh, dear all, it is my honor uh, to represent the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe here today. Earlier this week, the leaders of our 46 national delegations and five political groups already met here in Reykjavik. And on their behalf, I congratulate you all on this Reykjavik summit. It is the right moment, the right place, and the right issues. In 1949, the founders of the Council of Europe understood that maintaining peace would depend on the protection of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in all the member states. Since then, almost all European states have exceeded and made the Council of Europe a truly pan-European area of democratic security. By crossing Ukraine's borders on the 24th of February last year, the Russian Federation fundamentally challenged this post-war multilateral architecture of Europe. Therefore, Russia was rightfully and immediately expelled from the organization as unanimously requested by our assembly. Since then, restoring, strengthening and perhaps reinventing rules-based multilateralism against aggressive unilateralism has become an existential challenge and the main reason to meet here today in Reykjavik. Our Assembly appreciates that our input has been taken so seriously by you. We compliment you on the results. With you, our Assembly fully supports the creation of a comprehensive system to ensure the accountability of Russian Federation, including an ad hoc tribunal for the crime of aggression, a register of damage and viable, a viable mechanism to ensure the return of abducted children back home at its, as its cornerstone. With you, the Assembly wants the European Convention on Human Rights to be better safeguarded, the authority of our court better protected, and the execution of its judgments better guaranteed. And we want the European Union to accede to our Convention now. With you, our Assembly wants to reverse the dangerous backsliding of democracy by addressing its root causes and by formulating binding principles for democracy in all our Member States. And with you, our Assembly agrees that the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment must be recognized as a fundamental human right. This is the moment to act. Dear all, we are facing huge challenges. Let us show the courage to counter them. Our citizens demand it. Our citizens deserve it. Let us be the one to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tini. And now we we'll go over to the Prime Minister of Ukraine. Dear Dennis, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Your Excellencies, partners, friends, colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, over the years, the Council of Europe has played a crucial role in promoting democracy, upholding human rights, and ensuring the rule of law in Europe. Today, Europe faces extraordinary challenges in the face of the Russian Federation full-scale protracted and brutal aggression against Ukraine. This aggression is an affront to all the principles for which the Council of Europe stands and to be foundation of the European multilateral security architecture. Our common response must be resolute. The aggressor must not be allowed to prevail. Ukraine must restore its sovereignty over its entire territory. The Council of Europe has taken a number of decisive measures to counter Russian aggressor, aggression against Ukraine. The Council was the first international organization to advocate for the establishment of a comprehensive international compensation mechanism. The Council of Europe advocates the need for the establishment of a special international tribunal. The Council's parliamentary assembly was the first body of an international organization to call on Council of Europe member states to recognize the Russian regime as terrorist. All these decisions demonstrate leadership, and Ukraine is very grateful for this. 
the Council of Europe should maintain and its, strengthen uh, its leadership role in future, setting a good example for other international organizations. The fourth summit should have the ambition to set a forward-looking agenda for the Council of Europe. We expect the Council of Europe to continue to take a strong position on the issue of Russian aggression against Ukraine. The first step towards accountability is the creation of an international register uh, of the damage caused to Ukraine by Russian aggression. Today's decision to establish the, this register is without doubt historic. After that, we should prepare the necessary legal framework for the confiscation of Russian assets and establish a compensation fund. So comprehensive approach includes uh, creation of international tribunal and this should include all the rest needed issue which we discussed during our round tables, during our debates. Thank you so much, uh, dear Catherine, thank you so much for this organization, invitation, all of the leaders uh, here to Reykjavik for personal organization. So let us work together to build peace and justice in Europe. Let us work together to build a better future for all Europeans. This is not only our responsibility, but also our shared opportunity to shape a more resilient, inclusive and prosperous continent. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dennis. And now it's the President of Austria, Alexander van der Bellen. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Allow me to continue in German. Sehr geehrte Frau Vorsitzende, geschätzte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, vor genau 30 Jahren kamen unsere Vorgängerinnen und Vorgänger 1993 in Wien zum ersten Gipfeltreffen des Europarates zusammen. Angesichts der Überwindung der jahrzehntelangen Teilung Europas, aber auch angesichts des Bürgerkriegs auf dem Gebiet des ehemaligen Jugoslawien, gaben sie ein klares Bekenntnis zu Menschenrechten, Demokratie und Rechtsstaatlichkeit. Drei Jahrzehnte später sind wir Zeugen eines Angriffskriegs ungern der Brutalität. Russland hat sich damit klar außerhalb unserer europäischen Rechts- und Wertegemeinschaft gestellt. Darüber hinaus ist die liberale Demokratie in vielen Ländern Europas unter Druck. Wir haben also auch eine Entscheidung vor uns. Erliegen wir dem Ruf der einfachen Lösungen, des starken Mannes, der sich nicht um das demokratische Ringen nach der besten Lösung kümmern muss. Ein Weg, der in Russland zu Willkür, Rechtlosigkeit und Terror geführt hat. Ein Weg, der unendliches Leid für die Menschen in der Ukraine bringt. Und ein Weg, der Europa Unsicherheit und Wohlstandsverlust bringt. Oder wählen wir den Weg des Rechts, des Rechtsstaats, der uns seit 1945 Sicherheit und Wohlstand gebracht hat. Dass wir heute hier sind, zeigt, dass sich Europa für Recht, für Sicherheit und Wohlstand entscheidet. Es zeigt, dass wir bereit sind, gemeinsam und entschlossen jenen entgegenzutreten, die Menschenrechte, Demokratie und Rechtsstaatlichkeit bedrohen. Das gibt Hoffnung. Die Prinzipien für Demokratie von Reykjavik, die wir heute verabschieden, sind ein sichtbares Zeichen. Und ebenso stellt die Errichtung eines Registers der durch die russische Aggression in der Ukraine verursachten Schäden einen wesentlichen Schritt dar. Wir dürfen auch nicht tatenlos zusehen, wenn Kinder aus der Ukraine illegal nach Russland verschleppt, deportiert und zwangsadoptiert werden. Das Recht muss die Rechtlosigkeit besiegen. Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die Europäische Menschenrechtskonvention bildet das Rückgrat unseres Wertesystems. In Österreich steht sie zu Recht in Verfassungsrang und ist für uns eine demokratische Verpflichtung. Zum Schutz der Menschenrechte jeder und jedes Einzelnen müssen wir die entsprechenden Normen aber auch stets weiterentwickeln und den Herausforderungen der Zeit anpassen, sei es die Klimakrise, sei es Digitalisierung und künstliche Intelligenz. Nützen wir die kollektive Weisheit unserer Staaten im Europarat um unseren Bürgerinnen und Bürgern und allen, die bei uns leben, 
auch in Zukunft den bestmöglichen Schutz ihrer Rechte und damit Sicherheit und Wohlstand zu garantieren. Vielen Dank. Thank you, Alexander. And then it's the President of Cyprus, Mr. Nikos Christodoulides. Dear colleagues, during the, uh, the past century, Europe experienced two world wars and has lived through numerous atrocities, some, some of which have scared nations and inflicted irreversible harm upon families and individuals. European leaders showed determination to learn from uh, past mistakes, and they took the first steps towards unifying Europe. Today, the realities on the ground are for forcing us to reaffirm the commitments made more than 70 years ago. The declaration to be adopted today will renew our commitment to the fundamental principles and values of the Council of Europe and demonstrate our resolve to assist the Council in its crucial role of effectively responding to current and future challenges. We are very fortunate to rely on the significant support of both the European Convention of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights. It is our duty to ensure that court judgments are upheld. Failure to implement court judgments and the legal obligations associated with this result not only in the deprivation of rights, but also in the weakening of our ability together to work together with damaging consequences for the democratic fabric of our societies as a whole. Within this context, dear colleagues, it is important to remember that the Cyprus problem has not yet been resolved, that the status quo is not sustainable, and that decisions made in Strasbourg have a significant impact on the prospect of my country's reunification. I was elected president just three months ago. My utmost priority is to accept every possible effort to break the current stalemate and resume negotiations so as to achieve a solution in line with the relevant UN Security Council resolutions and the European Union agrees. The division of my country is still an anomaly that deprives Cypriot Europeans of the prospect of a meaningful prosperity and constitutes an open wound in the evolution of the international and European justice and human rights application system. In time of crisis, solutions can only be found through strength and collaboration, multilateralism and dialogue. This is a way we tend to follow, not only with regards to the Cyprus question, but also for the future of the Council of Europe and our continent. As per our theme in this general debate, our aim is to render Cyprus united for Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikos. And now we have the President of the Czech Republic, Petr Pavel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me first uh, thank the Icelandic Presidency uh, for organizing uh, this summit in a very efficient and uh, generous manner. Uh, today we are at the milestone moment uh, for uh, the Council of Europe. Uh, we are here to provide a new impetus to our organization, uh, express our unity, and uh, to demonstrate that the Council of Europe has become uh, even more uh, relevant in a world where international commitments of states are violated and basic principles of international uh, law are at stake. Uh, for all of us, uh, the re uh, reaction to Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine is uh, the key uh, topic uh, for uh, this uh, summit. Uh, Ukraine and uh, France uh, are not uh, in uh, this uh, uh, alone. Uh, we uh, are uh, at uh, their side. Uh, we stand in solidarity with them and uh, uh, we will assist them. Uh, many of us uh, visited Ukraine uh, and uh, witnessed uh, the horrors of uh, war in person uh, and uh, saw uh, the war uh, that uh, we hoped uh, to never uh, see in uh, Europe again. The Council of Europe uh, did not uh, and could not prevent uh, this war, uh, but it faced uh, this historical challenge uh, with uh, honor by uh, the swift expulsion of uh, the Russian Federation. It is crucial uh, to hold Russia and its leadership accountable. There has to be justice for the victims of uh, this uh, senseless war. Uh, for this reason, uh, Czechia supports the investigation by the ICC and uh, also the proposal for a special tribunal to prosecute uh, the perpetrators of the crime, uh, crime of aggression against Ukraine. We cannot uh, forget about the responsibility of the Russian state for the uh, incredible damage inflicted on Ukraine and its people. 
The register of damage uh, that uh, we are get, uh, setting up uh, these days is a key element uh, of uh, the Council of Europe's response uh, to Russia's uh, aggression. In this respect, I am proud to say uh, that uh, the Czech diplomacy played an active role in uh, the negotiation leading uh, towards the establishment of uh, this instrument. It is important uh, that uh, the register becomes operational uh, as soon as possible. While we focus on the situation in Ukraine, we must not forget about Georgia, Moldova, as well as other partners uh, facing Russian pressure and intimidation. They, cannot, uh, they can count on our support, including uh, on their uh, road to the EU membership. I would also like to use this opportunity to reiterate uh, our full support to Kosovo's intention to become a member of the Council of Europe as soon as possible. Finally, let me address briefly uh, two topics currently resonating in the relation between the Czech Republic and the Council of Europe. Uh, the first one is uh, the status of Roma population, particularly uh, the full uh, inclusion of Roma children into the education system. In my short period in office, uh, I have already devoted significant time to this issue. I visited uh, the most uh, affected regions of our country and also invited Roma high school and university students uh, to my office to personally uh, share their experience as a good example. The second issue is uh, the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. The Czech Republic signed this important treaty in 2016. I have encouraged both the government and the parliament to speed up the process uh, of uh, its uh, ratification. Let me conclude uh, by assuring you that the Czech Republic uh, will uh, continue to actively support the Council of Europe in its unique role. Thank you. Thank you, Petr. And now we have the President of Estonia, Alar Karis. Please. Thank you. Dear colleagues, the past year and day off has been a painful experience of events that will occur when autocracy prevails and human rights are ignored. We created the Council of Europe, OECE, NATO and the EU to make sure that we shall not witness a war in Europe ever again. Yet, a United Nations Security Council member has become an aggressor, trampling on the UN Charter, international law and the fundamental rights we all believe in. The credibility of international institutions depends on the response to this aggression. Therefore, it is our duty to make sure that aggressor will be held accountable and here the Council of Europe can play an important role. Establishing a register of damage is a first step towards accountability and it must not be the last one. I urge all countries and international organizations to become participant of an enlarged partial agreement. Furthermore, we must work towards the establishment of a compensation mechanism for victims for all the damages aggressor has caused. Finally, justice would not be complete without the prosecution of those responsible for the crime of aggression, and we should lend our support to the establishment of an international special tribunal with wide cross-regional UN participation. The systematic and massive international crimes are committed by Russia against the people of Ukraine. As stated by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, deportation of Ukrainian kids shows evidence of genocide according to the international definition of genocide. Among other atrocities, there is clear evidence collected by international organizations to prove the deportation of children from Ukraine to Russia. We must do our utmost to ensure the safe return of Ukrainian children forcibly transferred to Russia or territory in temporary occupies, as well as punishment of those who carried it out at all levels. Victims have names, and so do the aggressors who committed the crimes. We must bring them all to justice. The ICC's arrest warrants against Putin and Lvova Belova give hope for justice. Our determination to ensure impunity starts in our home countries. ICC's arrest warrants must be implemented by all its members. 
As my final remark, while focusing on <coughs> accountability, we are committed to secure and strengthen democracy, human rights and the rule of law at all levels throughout Europe. We must not forget the nurture of the fabric of human rights like freedom of expression or rising challenges of the environment and artificial intelligence. The only comprehensive approach to our human rights can ensure a better future for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Alar. And next, le prochain, c'est le président du Conseil européen, M. Charles Michel. Merci, Madame la Première ministre. Merci pour la leçon parfaite de cette réunion. Quelques points rapidement. Un, seulement 13% de la population mondiale vit dans un régime démocratique. C'est dire la pression sur le modèle que nous voulons défendre. Et nous le savons, cette guerre déclenchée contre l'Ukraine est une guerre contre un pays, contre un peuple. C'est aussi une guerre contre des valeurs. Ces valeurs démocratiques, ces valeurs de liberté, de dignité, ces valeurs de droits humains qui nous rassemblent. Union européenne et Conseil de, de l'Europe, c'est pour cela que cette réunion et cette déclaration est importante pour afficher la robustesse de notre unité, la robustesse de notre engagement. Et il y a un point qui est un point clé, qui est la clé de voûte, c'est l'état de droit. L'état de droit, l'indépendance de la justice, la liberté de, de la presse. Et en cela, l'Union européenne tente de renforcer ces dispositifs. Euh, je prends deux exemples. C'est la décision de Rénéran de conditionner certains financements au respect de l'état de droit. Ça montre notre ambition de nous imposer à nous-mêmes des standards élevés sur ce sujet-là. Il y a un autre exemple. Depuis trois ans, c'est le rapport annuel sur l'état de droit dans chacun des États membres qui, euh, depuis euh, le dernier qui est intervenu au mois de juillet 2022, établit également des recommandations pour chacun des pays. C'est montré qu'il y a là un effort constant. Je voudrais dire une chose avec force. Nous le savons, et certainement certains le savent davantage autour de ces tables, il y a un poison mortel contre la démocratie et contre nos valeurs. Ce poison mortel, c'est le cocktail entre la corruption et la désinformation. Et on sait que dans un certain nombre de pays, il y a un business model avec des oligarques, souvent proches de la Russie, qui achètent des médias, qui achètent des partis politiques et qui pratiquent une désinformation et une déstabilisation massive. Mais il y a un antidote, il y a un remède. L'antidote, c'est l'indépendance de la justice. L'antidote, c'est l'état de droit pour garantir l'égalité, la non-discrimination, c'est faire reculer ce cocktail, cette menace, ce poison, et ça doit être notre détermination à chacun. Et enfin, je conclue sur deux points très opérationnels. Nous souhaitons renforcer la coopération avec le Conseil de l'Europe, et c'est en cela que nous sommes en train d'adhérer, comme Union européenne, à la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme. Je suis optimiste que l'on pourra résoudre dernières difficultés très rapidement. Et nous sommes également en train d'adhérer à la Convention d'Istanbul. La présidence suédoise, je les félicite, travaille d'arrache-pied pour que dans les prochaines semaines, on puisse tenir cet objectif. Je vous remercie. Merci Charles. And next is the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Thank you very much, Catherine, and uh, dear colleagues. We should never forget that the first summit of the Council of Europe gathered 30 years ago after the fall of the Iron Curtain. When all of Europe united around the founding principles of this Council, all of Europe agreed that working together to promote democratic values is the best way to promote peace in Europe. Because, and this is right, war is unthinkable in the community of like-minded democracies. Today we gather against the backdrop of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Russia refuses to recognize the democratic right of Ukrainians to be the master of their own future. Russia's attack is, a, an, an, is an attack, Russia's war is an attack against everything we stand for in this Council of Europe. It is an attack against the founding principles The more important is that we join forces to protect and nurture and foster democracy. We all stand by Ukraine. The perpetrator has to be account held accountable and therefore the register of damages can and will play an important role. But fostering democracy, of course, begins at home. Democracy is never for granted. It's a constant work in progress. 
and the risk of democratic backsliding is real. This is why in the European Union we are monitoring the state of the rule of law in all member states every single year. We also put forward new initiatives for the equality of all citizens, new rules to fight corruption, and for the very first time, a Media Freedom Act. Cooperation with the Council of Europe plays a big role in this work for democracy. So today, I want to confirm the European Union's intention to join the European Convention on Human Rights as soon as possible. We want to strengthen our Union's democratic foundations like never before. Finally, with the backdrop of Russia's war, the last year has marked a turning point in many countries' path towards the European Union. From the Western Balkans, to Ukraine, to Moldova, to Georgia. We are standing strong together. And therefore, I see room for an even closer cooperation and partnership between the European Union, the Council of Europe, and each candidate country, so that the story of European democracy will be continued to be written in Ukraine and elsewhere on our continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ursula. And now we have the President of Finland, Sauli Ninisto, please. Thank you, Excellencies, uh, colleagues. Uh, for, my, for more than a year ago, Russia has been waging a war of aggression on Ukraine. It is uh, first and foremost uh, an attack against Ukraine and its people. But it is uh, also an attack against the fundamental values of which the Council of Europe is built peace, cooperation, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We must defend these commitments. Our support to Ukraine remains as strong and resolute as ever. With the establishment of the Register of Damage, the Council of Europe has taken an important step towards ensuring Russians' accountability. Finland supports further accountability efforts uh, by Ukraine nationally and by international institutions. While our primary <coughs> attention is uh, rightly on Ukraine, we stress the need for support also to Georgia, Moldova and the Western Balkans. Finland welcomes further steps to advance Kosovo's membership in the Council of Europe. As the multilateral rules-based system is challenged, the Council of Europe deserves our strongest support. The importance of the European Court of Human Rights and the full execution of its judgments can't be overemphasized. We must uphold the most comprehensive human rights protection system in the world. It is our defense against democratic backsliding. This uh, summit addresses the important link between the environment and human rights. We must also apply new technologies and artificial intelligence in ways that respect the rule of law and human rights. And we must prevent violence against women and uh, cybercrime, protect minorities, fight terrorism. The list is long. For this and uh, much more, the Council of Europe needs to stay efficient. Finland is grateful to the Icelandic uh, presidency for convening this summit uh, that sends a strong message. We will defend human rights, democracy and the rule of law wherever they are under threat. I also wish to express our support to Latvia for your upcoming presidency in carrying on this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Sauli. And next is the president of time. Greece, Mrs. Katerina Sakelaropoulou. Please. <laughs> Excellencies, I'd like to thank the current Icelandic and the previous presidencies for their work. 
Iceland for its hospitality and excellent organization, as well as the Parliamentary Assembly for an outstanding summit, which highlights the importance of the organization's fundamental pillars, democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. We once again reiterate our unfaltering support and tangible solidarity with Ukraine and those who are bravely defending their country because respect of independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity within a country's internationally recognized borders, as well as good neighborly relations, constitute an absolute prerequisite for the peaceful coexistence of people. We are gathered here to reconfirm our mutual commitment to a rule-based international system, multilateralism, and the need to respect international law. There cannot be a double standards approach when it comes to respect of it, nor a selective sensibility based on particular geopolitical interests. We should draw the right lesson from Russia's war against Ukraine. Mistakes of the past cannot be repeated. The Council of Europe led the way with its unanimous decision on 16th March 2022 to exclude the Russian Federation from its membership. Such a strong collective political decision is evidence of its unity and its determination to defend the fundamental values on which it was founded. The decision to establish the enlarged partial agreement on the register of damages caused by the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine is a resounding commitment, a commitment to justice, because without justice there can be no peace. Greece had steadfastly supported this initiative and we are the first member state of the Council of Europe to have notified our intention to be a founding member. We were all devastated by the destruction of Mariupol and the loss of human life, including many members of the Greek community with a historic presence in the region. Finally, we express our deep concern about the children of Ukraine who have been forcibly and unlawfully deported and transferred to Russia or Ukrainian areas occupied by the Russian forces. We also express our gratitude to Ukraine's neighboring countries for welcoming Ukrainian refugees and our solidarity with those who have fled the war and are and now residing in our countries. Greece has already welcomed tens of thousands of Ukrainian refugees. As a front-line Mediterranean country, we have already experienced in the past a huge migration wave. We therefore understand the need for unwavering support and fair burden sharing among all the member states of the Council of Europe. Experience has shown that solidarity cannot be selective. It is above all a question of collective political and humanitarian responsibility and commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And next is the President of Hungary, Katalin Novak. Please. Thank you so much, Katrin. And first, uh, thank you. Thank you, the hosts, uh, the government and the people of Iceland for welcoming here. And I think we normally don't sleep much, so we very much appreciate and take advantage of these short nights. So thank you for your hospitality and also thank you, the Council of Europe, for putting together this meeting in this very decisive moment. The setting couldn't be better for such an important meeting that play, takes place almost two decades after the summit in Poland. This should have been a summit of celebration. Our economies have never been so developed as they are today. We successfully recovered from the pandemic. We learned how to strengthen our common values and how to cope with the cultural, historical, linguistic diversity that makes Europe so unique and valuable. Yet there are a multitude of new and old challenges that call for our urgent attention and action. There is a brutal war raging on the continent of Europe and the peaceful way of our living is under attack. Russia's insane decision of attacking Ukraine, a direct neighbor to Hungary, turned our world upside down. Therefore, we need to take a unified and firm position. The armed attack and aggression against a sovereign state is unacceptable. War crimes must be investigated. War criminals need to face the might of the justice system. As a Christian conservative politician and as a mother, my most important goal is to find a path towards our ultimate goal, which should be undoubtedly a just peace. When all conditions of a just peace are met, conditions which permit not only a ceasefire, but a real long-lasting peace accompanied by reconciliation. 
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we need to reaffirm that all people have a right to live. Even people who happen to be caught in a war zone have the right to live. The Council of Europe is at the forefront in the protection and promotion of human rights and has done a great deal to facilitate respect for democracy, human rights and fundamental liberties over the last decades. That is why this is a proper time and place to formulate a strong message, the message of the right to peace. We as heads of state and government of the member states of the Council of Europe have a special kind of responsibility to promote and guarantee the peace for our citizens. I personally welcome that more and more leaders are willing to voice their support for a fair and just peace, which is a universal desire of all of our citizens. Our main, main international organizations, which have historically been devoted to peace, should also do their utmost to restore and reaffirm peace whenever it is broken. Finally, let me conclude and draw, to, draw your attention to the situation of ethnic and national minorities in Ukraine. You all know that we have an issue concerning the minority in Ukraine. We are there to help. Hungary welcomed almost two million refugees since the outbreak of the war. We should, in the meantime, pay special attention that the fight for freedom should not mean the denial of rights of ethnic communities. The respect for minorities is one of the core values on which the European cooperation lies on. We shouldn't discard it. I hope that the next summit of the Council of Europe will find us in a peaceful, strong, unified Europe of stable nation states. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you all for respecting the time limits. It's highly appreciated. Thank you. Next is the President of Latvia, Mr. Eil Slevitz, please. Excellencies, for almost 75 years, the Council of Europe has been a beacon of human rights, democracy and rule of law in Europe. Today, Russia is writing a bloody page in European history. Dear colleagues, the war of aggression is the gravest international crime of all. Unfortunately, the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction in this case. This is an unbearable gap in international law. Therefore, already short after the Russian attack, I propose to set up an international ad hoc tribunal to try this case. This is necessary for three reasons. First, to do justice for Ukraine. Second, to uphold the standard of international law achieved after the Second World War, which forbids aggressive wars. And third, not to undermine the credibility of, the our, of our democratic values. The last reason is particularly important for the Council of Europe, which is, or, last, or at least should be, an organization of democratic states based on the rule of law. Latvia and dozens of other states are already working together in the United Nations to set up the International Ad Hoc Tribunal on the Russian crime of aggression. Legally, it is possible. All what is needed is political will. I call on you all, dear colleagues to join this initiative. Russia must also compensate Ukraine for all losses. I therefore welcome the decision to establish the register of damage caused by Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Latvia is among the register's founding members, and we invite other countries to join it. The Council of Europe must also address the new challenges, such as the impact of digital technologies on democracy and human rights. I encourage to speed up the work on the new legal instrument on artificial intelligence. Otherwise, it may be too late. We must ensure that digital technology meets the standards of human rights and they do not infringe on democratic processes of our societies. To do this, we have to be politically and legally creative and courageous. Excellencies, later today, Latvia will assume its second presidency of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. It is our collective duty to prevent the democratic backsliding by protecting our common values and freedoms. Thank you. Thank you, Eils. And now it's the President of the Republic of Moldova, Maya Santu. The floor is yours. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, democracy is in decline in every region of the world, but not in my country, the Republic of Moldova. 
Over the past two years, we have worked tirelessly to cut the influence of oligarchs in politics, on the economy, media, and political parties. We started cleaning up a corrupt justice system. No doubt, we still have a lot of work to do, but improved international rankings are a testament to our efforts and political determination to strengthen our democracy. In the Press Freedom Index, published by Reporters Without Borders, Moldova has climbed 61 positions in two years alone, from 89 to 28 out of 180 countries. On the Rule of Law Index of the World Justice Project, we have advanced by 14 positions since 2020. On corruption perception, as measured by Transparency International, we improved by 24 positions in the last two years. On gender equality, we are ranked 16th, 16th today. On democracy indexes overall, we have improved last year too. On the Council of Europe uh, Moneyval, we have upgraded, we have been upgraded to largely compliant from partially compliant. And I would like to thank the Council of Europe as a long-standing partner uh, working with us in strengthening Moldova's democracy. My message to you today is that where there is political will, change happens. Democracies mature, societies become more resilient. But in the face of current challenges, this is not enough for democracy to survive and flourish in my country. It's not enough for change to happen sustainably. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has shaken the entire European continent. While nothing compares to the devastation suffered by Ukraine, we feel the shock waves from the war just across our border. We are on the receiving end of a Russian-backed hybrid methods which are designed to destabilize our democracy. The aggression unleashed by Russia against Ukraine has impacted our national security and created an uncertain environment. Our citizens and entrepreneurs continue to struggle with the economic repercussions of soaring energy prices and disruption of trade routes. Our economy needs to grow for democracy to stand a chance. Russia's disinformation and propaganda need to be disarmed for our democracy to stand a chance. We've been holding the line against Russia's destabilization efforts and will continue to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, our democracy is backed up by strong political will, but it cannot stand alone against the magnitude of the challenges we are currently facing. Russia will continue to be a source of instability for the region for years to come. Our best way to consolidate our democracy and freedom is to join the European Union. In Moldova, there is a political opportunity for the democratic world. There is a chance to prove that democracy can deliver despite the unprecedented challenges. Champions of reforms need unwavering support to keep the window of opportunity wide open. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our friends and partners who are standing in solidarity with my country and foremost in solidarity with Ukraine. It is high time to say loud and clear that no one is above the law. Moldova joins the register of damage caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Continue helping Ukraine. Continue helping Moldova so that together we can carry on defending our democracies and the European value that we choose as our present and our future. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. And next is Andrzej Duda, the president of Poland, please. Catherine, thank you very much for invitation and excellent organization of this summit. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, the previous summit of the Council of Europe was held 18 years ago in Warsaw. Since then, the world has changed dramatically. Today's summit takes place in an extremely difficult international environment. At the previous summit in 2005, we talked about the new perspectives and how to strengthen Europe. It was a time of great optimism, right after the largest European Union's enlargement. Today, we meet in times of the biggest war since World War II, in which European values and identity are at stake. The barbaric aggression of Russia against Ukraine violated all norms, principles and values on which international order is based. 
the heroic struggle of Ukrainians to defend their own country is also a struggle for the future of Europe. That is why our united support to Ukraine is of crucial importance. We need to commit here to upholding our solidarity with Ukraine as long as it takes. The war, started so cynically by Russia, causes immense suffering of civilians, especially women, children, people with disabilities and elderly people. It's our moral duty to continue helping them. We need to bring the abducted children of Ukraine back to their homes and families. We thus welcome the steps taken today by the Council of Europe in this regard. Poland, as a victim of numerous aggressions, knows well the importance of ensuring accountability for the crimes committed during the war in Ukraine. Crimes against humanity, and crimes of war must be prosecuted to the fullest extent until the last perpetrator is brought to justice and every victim receives just compensation for their suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the ongoing efforts of the Council of Europe to support Ukraine through the action plan focused on resilience, recovery and reconstruction. It's yet another proof of the relevance and importance of our organization. Poland will remain committed to supporting this action plan as well as those aimed at assisting Georgia and Moldova. We know from experience that the assistance of the Council of Europe is particularly important to its member states aiming to join the European Union. We must keep working together to accelerate progress in Western Balkans countries, Ukraine's, Georgia's and Moldova's path to European Union. Let me also stress the important role the Council of Europe plays in supporting civil society and democratic forces in Belarus. We need to increase pressure on the Lukashenko regime and fight to release all political prisoners, including journalist Andrzej Pochobut and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aleś Bielacki. Bringing free Belarus into our European family should remain one of the strategic priorities of the Council of Europe. In order to remain an active and important player in today's world, the Council of Europe must focus not only on political challenges, but also social and economic ones. It must be resilient, robust and efficient. We must also invest in the potential of young people through education on democracy and human rights. They will soon become leaders of our countries and our democratic future will be in their hands. Ladies and gentlemen, despite Putin's mad war, we must fight to strengthen democracy and freedom in today's world. I firmly believe that the war in Ukraine will end with the victory of the free world. Then a new chapter in the history of the Council of Europe will begin. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And uh, I will use this opportunity to remind everybody to stay within the time limits. And next to have the floor is Klaus Johannes, the President of Romania. Please. Thank you, Prime Minister. <clears throat> Distinguished heads of delegations, excellencies, it is an honor to be here today for the fourth summit of the Council of Europe. Today we have a historic opportunity to increase the efficiency and resilience of our organization. The Council of Europe has been the long-standing and faithful companion for Romania during its historic journey of 30 years of membership that we celebrate this year, from a state in transition to that of a stable and mature democracy. Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine in 2022 as a continuation of the aggression started in 2014 has caused suffering and destruction for millions of Ukrainians, bringing war and its atrocities once again on the European continent. 
It generated overlapping crises and challenges and fueled the erosion of the democratic informational space. It reminded us once again how precious yet fragile peace is, that freedom is a constant fight and that democracy is worth fighting for. Guaranteeing hard security is the foundation for our security, but security also means societal resilience given by democracy, by individual liberties, by rule of law, by accountability, by fighting disinformation and having reliable food and energy supplies. For responding to the exceptional challenges raised by Russia's aggression against Ukraine, the Council of Europe took bold measures. But we must continue to do more to help Ukraine in its fight for a future based on democratic principles and the rule of law. Russia's aggression against Ukraine must remain high on the organization's agenda. In this context, let me underline that we fully support the Reykjavik Declaration and the establishment of the register of damage in Ukraine caused by the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. We need to ensure accountability and to fight decisively against impunity. Dear colleagues, I would like to also reiterate our commitment to the European Convention on the Human Rights System. Romania welcomes the Council of Europe's approach to environment protection and climate change. Therefore, we support the process launched in Reykjavik on the streamlining of the organization's work in relation to the environment. The cooperation of the Council of Europe with its strategic partner, the European Union, as well as with the other international organizations, is essential for our common efforts of outreach all over the world. Consolidating the partnership between these organizations remains of utmost importance in order to create synergies. As a final remark, I want to congratulate the Icelandic Presidency for the outstanding work to organize this summit and to express our wishes of success to the incoming Latvian Presidency. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. And now we have the two captain regions of San Marino, Alessandro Scarano and Adel Tonini. Grazie, Katrin. Cari colleghe e colleghi, con sentimenti di alto onore e profonda motivazione siamo oggi qui riuniti con il fermo proposito di mantenere l'unità e la condivisione sul ruolo pionieristico del Consiglio d'Europa nelle sfide globali e negli assetti democratici e geopolitici del nostro continente. È pleonastico sottolineare la perdurante preoccupazione e la sofferenza che ha provocato in tutti noi la terribile aggressione che ha colpito l'Ucraina, determinando nella nostra organizzazione l'unanime deliberazione del Consiglio dei Ministri, che il 16 marzo dello scorso anno sancì la fuoriuscita della Federazione Russa dal Consiglio d'Europa con effetto immediato. La posizione che necessariamente siamo stati chiamati ad assumere non ha incrinato, bensì rafforzato, il ruolo e il comune impegno multilaterale verso la strenua difesa dei principi del diritto, della democrazia e della giustizia. Siamo riuniti in questo vertice a Reykjavik che, sotto la saggia e illuminata presidenza di turno islandese, che ringraziamo sentitamente, per rinnovare la coscienza dell'Europa per ribadire convintamente che la guerra provoca devastazioni e inaccettabili perdite di vite umane, ma non scalfisce i valori e i principi che si pongono al di sopra dello stesso individuo e alla base della civile convivenza. Reiteriamo il nostro accorato appello affinché al più presto vengano ripristinate condizioni di pace nella martoriata Ucraina e confermiamo la nostra fraterna solidarietà al suo popolo, che sta lottando per la difesa della libertà e l'affermazione dei principi di autodeterminazione, principi e valori che hanno fondato l'antica Repubblica di San Marino e in virtù dei quali è ancora oggi un fulgido esempio di libertà e di pacifica convivenza. Con grande soddisfazione abbiamo accolto la volontà da parte del governo sanmarinese 
di voler aderire all'accordo parziale allargato per la creazione di un registro che documenti i danni subiti dall'Ucraina determinati dall'aggressione della Federazione russa. Un'iniziativa questa che contribuirà a garantire il pieno risarcimento dei danni subiti, delle perdite e delle lesioni causate dal conflitto in corso, anche mediante un'azione risarcitoria globale. Questo quarto vertice è altresì un'occasione di confronto sulle minacce crescenti di una crisi ambientale di dimensioni allarmanti e sulla quale abbiamo il dovere di intensificare gli sforzi e le azioni su scala multilaterale. Da questo bellissimo Paese che ci ospita possiamo, possa essere lanciato un appello ancora più forte e una sorta di ultimatum per una mobilitazione paneuropea che promuova e solleciti strategia e comportamenti virtuosi a tutti i livelli. Con piena convinzione sosteniamo tutti gli ulteriori obiettivi del Vertice, sui quali anche San Marino si impegna fin da ora a fare la sua parte, dai principi di Reykjavik per la democrazia a un rinnovato impegno nei confronti del sistema della Convenzione europea dei diritti dell'uomo a tutela dell'attività della Corte. Ci rallegriamo inoltre e condividiamo la volontà della Presidenza islandese di porre particolare attenzione alla promozione dei diritti delle donne e dei minori temi altrettanto sensibili e ai vertici dell'attuale agenda istituzionale sammarinese. È nell'auspicio che questo vertice, quarto vertice, apra la strada ad un multilateralismo rinnovato e rafforzato che sia inclusivo e sappia giocare un ruolo dirimente nella gestione delle sfide dei nostri giorni, che esprimiamo un sentito ringraziamento per l'attenzione a, a noi riservata. Grazie. Thank you, Alessandro and Adele. And now, uh, Susanna Ciaputova, President of the Slovak Republic, please. Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you to Icelandic Presidency for hosting us here in Reykjavik for this very important summit. The mission of the Council of Europe is simple but essential, to safeguard democracy, the rule of law and human rights because they are the best defense against authoritarianism and remain the bedrock of peace in Europe. Today, these shared democratic values are under a rising pressure. Extremists and populists portray the rule of law, independent judiciary or the protection of minorities as weaknesses or unnecessary limitations. And they use democratic rights such as freedom of speech or freedom of expression to attack democracy itself. They use online platforms to spread polarization and hatred. Therefore, the Council of Europe must fulfill its vital role in protecting our fundamental values, including the rights of sexual or religious minorities, and use its expertise to propose guidelines that would protect democracy and human rights, not just offline, but also online. In 1949, Council of Europe emerged from the ashes of the most devastating war humankind ever experienced. Today, its mission is as urgent as it was seven decades ago. Russia's military aggression against Ukraine has returned big war to Europe, threatening millions of innocent civilians. It goes against everything the Council of Europe stands for. It's a direct threat to peace, security, and democracy. It's our common duty to ensure that this aggression stops, that Ukraine, which is defending its people and territory, gets the support it needs, that those who started the war are held accountable, including at a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. Like many of you, I saw first-hand the damage Russia has done in Ukraine. I spoke to the victims of Russia's sexual violence or children who had been deported from their homeland. Thousands of Ukrainian boys and girls still remain in Russia. We must do what we can to bring them back to their homeland. Never again is not a slogan. It's a principle we must follow. Dear colleagues, Council of Europe's 74 years show that the only way to protect our values and safeguard peace is by acting in unity. As member countries of this Council, but also internally 
as diverse and inclusive societies. So societies which also protect healthy environment for future generations. The declaration of the Reykjavik principles for democracy confirms that our determination and resolve is as strong as ever. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And now we have the President of Slovenia, Natasja Musar, please. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by congratulating the Icelandic Presidency and thanking the Prime Minister for bringing us together in Iceland and this, at this somber time of, uh, uh, for Europe. We are here to unite behind our shared values of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. These fundamental values have guided Slovenia since independence and joining the Council of Europe 30 years ago. It saddens me to see how war has entered Europe again. So let me be clear. Slovenia condemns in the strongest terms Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. We stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and will continue to provide assistance as long as is necessary. We support all efforts to hold accountable all those responsible for crimes committed in Ukraine. The establishment of the register of damage is an important step in this regard. I would like to focus my remarks on three main points. Firstly, the question of our time is how do we reverse the backsliding on democracy, the rule of law, human rights and minority rights? This is the crux of why we have gathered here in Reykjavik. We have to do our utmost to reverse this trend, fulfill our obligations and abide by our shared standards. We must lend our full support to the Council of Europe as our continent's leading and indispensable guardian of legal obligations and shared standards on the rule of law, minority rights and human rights. Independence of judiciary and media freedom are key in safeguarding these obligations and standards. I can tell you from my own experience that media freedom should not be taken for granted. And as we all know too well, democracy dies in darkness. Secondly, and closely related to my first, first point, is the most critical obligation that all our states share, namely the full and timely execution of the judgments of the European Court on Human Rights. Slovenia strongly supports the supervisory mechanism for the execution of judgments and all other independent monitoring mechanisms of the Council of Europe. A growing trend of non-execution of the court's judgments is deeply concerning and unacceptable. The rules apply to all of us equally. This is an area where there should be no backsliding. And my third and final point, the Council of Europe's role as the standard setter for current and emerging human rights challenges is equally important. On the protection of the environment and on climate change, the Council of Europe should play a leading role. We welcome today's decision and Slovenia can help. We continue to be globally vocal about the right to a clean and healthy environment as a human right. New technologies and artificial intelligence are getting ahead of us and it is high time for the regulation of their use in a human rights friendly way. Unless we act quickly and decisively, their effects on the enjoyment of our human rights could be devastating. It is we who hold the key to the future. Let us make sure it's human friendly. The world today may be changing, but the need for respect for human rights and dignity remains as, it, as important as ever. On behalf of my country, Slovenia, I am ready to help make sure that we conclude this summit with a strong and positive message for the future of the Council of Europe and for all of us in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And now, uh, next, number 21 on the speaker's list is the Vice President of the Republic uh, of Bulgaria, Iliana Jotova. Please, the floor is yours. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, permettez-moi d'exprimer ma reconnaissance à nos hôtes pour uh, l'accueil chaleureux et pour l'excellente organisation du quatrième sommet du Conseil de l'Europe. 
plus d'une année après l'agression contre l'Ukraine, je voudrais réitérer le soutien inconditionnel de la Bulgarie pour la souveraineté de l'Ukraine, son indépendance et l'intégrité territoriale. Nous condamnons l'agression russe qui continue et en reste en toute solidarité avec l'Ukraine et son peuple. Nous appelons la Russie de cesser son agression et de retirer ses forces de territoire occupées. La Bulgarie se félicite du rôle important du Conseil de l'Europe en étant partie des efforts internationaux pour engager la responsabilité pour la crime d'agression contre l'Ukraine. Nous soutenons l'accord partiel élargi sur le registre de dommages causés par l'agression russe contre l'Ukraine. Nous saluons le rôle actif du Conseil de l'Europe qui, dans l'étroite coopération avec les autorités ukrainiennes, dans la lutte contre l'expulsion illégale et le transfert forcé d'enfants ukrainiens vers Russie, ainsi qu'assurer un retour sécurisé à la maison pour ses enfants. Mesdames et Messieurs, ça fait plus que 15 ans que l'Europe vit en état de crise qui se poursuivent l'une après l'autre. Financière, économique, sociale, migratoire, les réfugiés, la pandémie et maintenant la guerre en Ukraine. Toutes ces crises sont le sujet de débats intenses, des propositions et de solutions. Des idées commencent à sortir. Ces débats se terminent parfois par le succès, parfois par l'échec. La division dans la société est en fait. Les inégalités deviennent de plus en plus visibles. Les conflits dominent suite au sentiment d'insécurité. Les gens se posent de plus en plus l'un contre l'autre. L'une des tendances les plus dangereuses qui s'approfondit, c'est la suspension des droits de l'homme obtenue pendant des décennies inscrites dans des documents fondamentaux. Ce sont des droits qui font la base de l'institution la plus importante qui veille sur le respect des droits. C'est le Conseil de l'Europe. Pire, de plus en plus de politiques parlent de droits de l'homme comme d'une survivance ou bien comme d'une politique de luxe. Par conséquent, nous devons être particulièrement vigilants quand nous sommes confrontés à l'intolérance, à la violation des droits ethniques et la discrimination. Ce serait imprévoyant si nous ignorons les problèmes et n'en parlons pas franchement. Je voudrais aborder de nouveau les droits des Bulgares en République de Macédoine du Nord. Je parle de leurs droits qui sont systématiquement violés, non reconnus, et des Bulgares qui sont soumis au harcèlement et aux restrictions. Je voudrais rappeler que la République de Macédoine du Nord est sur le point d'entamer des négociations d'adhésion à l'Union européenne. Il y a quelques mois à peine, quand en Macédoine du Nord, un jeune homme a été battu parce qu'il avait déclaré son identité ethnique bulgare. Les clubs des Bulgares sont incendiés et une loi a été adoptée qui en pratique interdit le fonctionnement de ces communautés. Il y a à peine quelques jours, un membre bulgare du Parlement européen n'a pas été laissé entrer en Macédoine du Nord à l'occasion d'une commémoration historique, notamment pour qu'il rende hommage à une cimetière militaire. Ça démontre une provocation grave envers nos valeurs européennes communes comme l'unité, la solidarité et le respect mutuel. La tendance la plus dangereuse, c'est le discours de haine très répandu en ce qui concerne un pays voisin qui est aussi membre du, et du Conseil de l'Europe et de l'Union européenne, mon pays, la Bulgarie. Je parle de ces faits parce que garantir les droits de l'homme ne peut pas rester uniquement dans les documents et dans les discours. Toute tentative de violation des droits de l'homme doit être combattue par notre position et nos actions catégoriques et déterminées. En conclusion, je voudrais saluer la future présidence du comité des ministres en lui souhaitant plein succès et l'assurer de notre plein soutien. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci, Iliana. And next is the Prime Minister of Albania, Idi Rama. Please. Thank you. Uh, I apologize up front because uh, I must make a not pleasant confession. As an Albanian, it is impossible for me to avoid drawing parallels between Ukraine and President Zelensky and Kosovo and President Thaci. 
Today at this Council of Europe summit, I cannot help but remember that the injustice towards the Kosovo Liberation War and its leader, Hashim Thaci, started precisely at the Council of Europe. Under the malign influence of the then member of this Council, Russian Federation. Kosovo's president, or as someone named Joe Biden referred to him, the George Washington of Kosovo, is now being tried by a special tribunal established and funded by the democratic world, but based on a 2011 Council of Europe report, which was diabolically sponsored by representatives of Vladimir Putin's party in the Council of Europe Assembly. Completely unfounded allegations of human trafficking were raised then as the start of a criminal smear campaign against Kosovo and Albania. And when I heard Kremlin propaganda talking about human organ trafficking by neo-Nazis in Donbas, it seemed like I saw President Zelensky, 10 years later, tried by a special tribunal founded on the same absurd charges. Sorry for this brutally inconvenient introduction, which may seem to you like breaking in pieces the piano where was wonderfully played the song Ave Maria by our hosts. But it is extremely disheartening to know that the troubling situation involving the President of Kosovo and the Kosovo Liberation Army originated within the Council of Europe. I would be guilty of remaining silent if I did not speak up here today and say the following. The Council of Europe Assembly has a moral obligation to correct any mistakes and in this case should open the way to retract the report that falsely labeled Albania as a base for the alleged organ traffic trafficking facilitated by the Kosovo Liberation Army. Refusing to face the truth today would be worse than making a grave mistake 12 years ago when many voted with closed eyes that disgraceful report in good faith. Of course, today the situation has changed. Russia is no longer a member of this council. Although the number of Russians who continue to work for the Council of Europe is very impressive. And thanks God, the unity of the Council's democratic community in support of the Ukrainian liberation war and President Zelensky is extraordinary. Albania has never had illusions about the nature of the regime in Moscow and our relations with Moscow have been non-existent since the death of Josef Vissarionovich Stalin. Don't ask me to explain how and why, because it would take longer than our trip to Iceland. Since the beginning of the war, the popularity of Vladimir Putin in Albania has varied from 0.7% to 1.2%. Albania is very small to influence the fate of such a decisive war for the future of Europe and the world. But every little thing we have done for Ukraine has been done with great gratitude towards the Ukrainian resistance. This is also why the most beautiful of things we Albanians will take away from this summit, so well organized by our Icelandic hosts. Thank you, Katrin, and thank you, Iceland, for what you so bravely and firmly did by shaking the status quo and getting finally Kosovo in this big community. So is the conviction of everyone here expressed so eloquently by some colleagues. It is not President Zelensky who should thank us, but we who should thank Ukraine for what it is doing for all of us and for our dear Europe. I thank you all and I'll happily sign the agreement on the register of damages before leaving this gracious country. God bless Europe and Slava Ukraina. Thank you, Edi. And now to Mr. Nikol Pashinyan, the Prime Minister of Armenia. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, based on our own experience, we can say that war is the biggest threat to democracy. 
For a long time, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict served as an excuse for the lack of democracy in Armenia. In 2018, our Velvet Revolution provided great democratic developments in Armenia. But in September 2020, Azerbaijan attacked Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia had to get involved in the war. Many still think that the cause of the war was Armenia's aspiration for democracy in the region where democracy may be viewed with suspicion. On November 9, 2020, I signed a trilateral ceasefire agreement which became a reason for attack on the state institution in Armenia. But we were able to maintain the country's democracy. We decided to conduct early elections to safeguard public accord. On May 12, 2021, two days after my and National Assembly's resignation came into effect for the purpose of the elections, Azerbaijan invaded the territory of Armenia. If we diverted from our way to democracy, we would have lost our statehood but we provided the internationally recognized free and democratic elections and shaped the agenda of peace. But our agenda of peace was also attacked. In November 2021 and in September 2022, Azerbaijan again invited the territory of Armenia. On October 6, 2022, with support of the French President Macron and President of EU Council Michel, we reached an agreement with the President of Azerbaijan that we normalize our relations on the basis of 1991 Almaty Declaration, according to which administrative borders of the former Soviet Armenia and Soviet Azerbaijan would become our state borders. Three days ago, with the mediation of the President of EU Consul Charles Michel, we made a step further emphasizing that Armenia recognizes Azerbaijan's territory of 86.6 thousand square kilometers and Azerbaijan recognizes the territory of Armenia of 29.8 thousand square kilometers. But as a result of illegal blockade of Lachin Corridor, the Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh have been under siege for five months and are facing humanitarian crisis. To send an international fact-finding mission to the Lachin Corridor and Nagorno-Karabakh is of high priority today, and to start Baku-Stepanakert negotiations aimed at providing security and human rights for the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh under the international mechanism is of vital importance. Assisting in addressing these issues the Council of Europe will promote democracy and stability in the South Caucasus. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And then we have the Prime Minister of Denmark, Mette Frederiksen. Please. Thank you so much, Catherine, for hosting us today. And thank you so much for a very successful summit. Uh, when we meet today only for the fourth time ever in the wake of Russia's brutal invasion of a peaceful neighbor, we are reminded, all of us, of the everlasting importance of our common values. And today we make the Council of Europe as strong, stronger than ever before, without Russia and because of Russia. Here in Iceland we are making an important and a very concrete contribution to justice, discussing how to make sure that the acts of war do not go unpunished, making sure that the damage in Ukraine is registered, the first step to ensure that um, is to make sure that the men and women and children of Ukraine can be compensated for the damage caused by a meaningless war. We strongly condemn the use of systematic rape and sexual assault against women and girls in, in Ukraine. Um, and I think this is our sign to the people of Ukraine that there is hope, of course, for a better future once the war is over. 
And at the same time, uh, sitting around this table, we must not forget to support the member states of Georgia and Moldova in the front line facing pressure from Russia. For almost 75 years ago, the European Convention on Human Rights was served to protect the fundamental rights of all citizens of Europe. Today, uh, I think it stands as one of the world's best examples of how human rights can be safeguarded. Looking ahead, we have a common responsibility to constantly make sure that our principles are accepted and also, of course, applied. Therefore, I welcome the Reykjavik principles for democracy. We must continue our efforts to prevent democratic backsliding, as some of you have said today. And while we benefit from new technologies, we have to make sure that our democratic uh, rights are preserved. Um, and therefore, we also, from a Danish perspective, uh, support um, the Council's standing setting efforts on this regard. Um, the next step, I would say, after these two very successful days is to make sure that um, our commitments and our values are putting, uh, will be put into to practice. But once again, Catherine, thank you for a very successful summit and um, thank you all of you. Thank you so much, Mada. And now we have the Prime Minister of Croatia, Andrei Plenković. Please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Prime Minister uh, Jakob Zotir. It's a great pleasure to take part at the fourth summit of the Council of Europe, and in particular, recalling a, a small personal note that when I was a young diplomat almost 30 years ago, I was in the part of the team which worked on Croatia's membership to the Council of Europe. And now, many years later, we are in the organization that we very much like and appreciate for 27 years. And Croatian former, my foreign ministry in my first government, Maria Pecinovic Buric, is the secretary general of the organization. And moreover, we are in the country that was the first Western country and the first member of, at the time, Council of Europe that has recognized Croatia independence in 1991 and I would la like to pay a token of appreciation to your former foreign minister Hannibalson who was the leader of the recognition not only for us but also for the Baltic states. Uh, I very much subscribe to our declaration and the annexes that we are <laughs> adopting today. I think um, they are substantive in a sense that this summit is actually the reaffirmation and the emancipation to the wider European public of our pan-European organization. Organization that has forged the values of respect of human rights, of democracy, of rule of law, of fundamental freedoms. And I think that our strong adherence to the acquis of the ECHR is in particular important today. Because uh, the fundamental values are under attack. Freedom is under attack, democracy is under attack, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has somehow awakened us all from the welfare and peace that Europe has been enjoying for many decades after the Second World War, bar the aggression time of Milosevic's regime to the countries of the former Yugoslavia, including Croatia. In that respect, um, we are strongly uh, committed to the solidarity to Ukraine. We have signed yesterday the Register of Damage. We are seconding experts uh, who have unfortunate expertise to have been involved in the processing of war crimes to Ukraine. And we feel that the entire organization should really provide an added value in the overall international and multilateral architecture. Uh, to Ukraine because at the end of the day the entire Council of Europe was the creation of the European legal community most of all over the past decades. And with that respect and a lot of support to our Ukrainian friends, I thank you, Katrin, for having organized this summit here in Reykjavik and we have enjoyed it immensely. Thank you, André. And next we have the Prime Minister of Belgium, Alexander Ducro. Please. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine, first of all, for the great hospitality here and a great organization uh, here. I think this, uh, this meeting here shows, again, the unique place that the Council of Europe has in, in the current geopolitical landscape. And um, topics like uh, rule of law, uh, human rights, democracy, these are topics we don't talk too much about when all goes well. Um, but we realize that all of us, any of us, might in a certain situation see these fundamental rights being questioned. And at a moment like that, we're happy that an organization like this uh, exists. Who would have imagined five years ago that we would do a meeting here with this type of, uh, of presence? And it shows that the Council of Europe is there in sunny days, but especially also in, uh, in, uh, in, in rainy days. Um, we, uh, th th this Ukraine war has made clear how our future is at, uh, is at stake and how a, a rules-based international order is, is, is at the core of our, of our functioning. And we are obviously extremely uh, happy with the decision that to expel uh, Russia. This was a decision which was uh, imperative. Um, accountability is, is, is a key element, and I think that the Council of Europe there showed um, how rapidly it could come up with a solution, which is a, which is a crucial one. Uh, too often in this war, uh, we see many things happen, uh, but we, we tend to forget the suffering of the Ukrainian population, of the Ukrainian civilians. And they've shown an incredible amount of, uh, of courage and an incredible amount of, of resilience, um, making clear with this mechanism that um, uh, nothing will go unpunished is a very clear message that we will, uh, we will continue to be on their side and we will do whatever it takes and to make clear it will be plenty. And these are the words that Mario Draghi used when he was defending the euro. Actually, I think we're in the same situation. We have to make clear that we will continue to be on their side and that if, if it needs to take a lot of effort and a lot of time that we will continue to, uh, to be there. Um, Furthermore, Belgium shares the international community's concern about the fate of, uh, of, of in particular, children, uh, which are being illegally transferred and deported. These criminal practices must stop immediately, and all children must be released and sent, uh, and sent home. European Court of Human Rights plays a key role in promoting democratic stability in, in Europe, and I'm happy to emphasize its role here again. We are very committed to the promotion and the protection of human rights of every person in our society, including children, women, and LGBTQA plus uh, people. We attach great importance to the Istanbul uh, Convention, and implementing this convention will be a priority for Belgium, both domestically and in our uh, foreign uh, policy. In 2018, Belgium established a fund within the Council of Europe. With this fund, we support all projects that strengthen human rights and fight against all types of discrimination and rule of, um, of law. Um, in our respective countries and in the Council of Europe, we must have the courage to assert loud and clear the values for which we are ready to fight and denounce with conviction all abuses and transgressions, and that that will not be uh, tolerated. So again, thank you for this uh, for the summit and the very strong message that comes out of this uh, summit. Um, human rights, rule of law, democracy, it's at the core and it's a daily endeavor for us to defend it. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And next, it's the Prime Minister of Georgia, Mr. Irakli Garibashvili, please. Thank you very much, dear Catherine, dear colleagues, dear friends. First of all, I have to say that I'm honored to participate in the fourth summit of the heads of state and governments of the Council of Europe, and would like to thank the host country for the hospitality and excellent organization of this very important event. Let me start by reaffirming the Georgia's commitment to protect and promote fundamental principles of democracy, rule of law, and human rights, as enshrined in the statute of the Council of Europe and in the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Today, Europe is undergoing through one of the most challenging periods caused by the Russia's aggression against Ukraine. In breach of fundamental norms and principles of the UN Charter, Helsinki Final Act, and the Statute of the Council of Europe, Georgia firmly supports Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, drawing from its own experience of the Russian aggression in 2008, when we had a full-scale war with Russia. And as you know, our country suffered a lot from this war, and 20 percent of our territory is still occupied by Russia. So therefore, we Georgians know very well 
the price of the war and the price of the peace. Since we regained our independence, we have witnessed several wars in our country. We are, no co we are conscious of what war brings, that we do everything for peace. In our post-independence history, for the first time, during our government's tenure in power, we have safeguarded the long-term and uninterrupted peace in Georgia. It is obvious that today the global order is changing. The world will never be the same again, and no one can find a way out of this difficult situation alone. So therefore, we need unity and global consolidation for a new, just order. Only by standing together we will achieve this goal. Dear friends, in recent years, democracies around the world have faced a number of challenges testing the very essence of their foundations. Despite such challenges, the state of democracy in Georgia is strong and resilient, and as our, as our government stands committed to the values that underpin it, including freedom, equality, and the rule of law. My government has a vision for a strong Georgia committed to democratic institutions and a free market economy. The above is reflected in our multidimensional approach in strengthening public bodies that are essential to democracy, such as the judiciary, electoral system, and independent media in protecting human rights, as well as in, in ensuring overall stability, sustainability, and predictability for the Georgian people. Since coming to power in 2012, our government has been developing effective and efficient policies and solidifying our vision through dynamic actions. Reforming the judiciary, improving the electoral system, and ensuring media independence has been key elements of, the government, of Georgia's development agenda. With four waves of the reforms in the judiciary, in changes in election legislation, and media legal framework provides for a solid basis for ensuring protection of rights and freedoms of individuals, as well as freedom of expression and media rights. Today, this trusted environment in the above areas have been commanded by renowned organizations such as Transparency International, World Justice, Project Freedom House, and etc., ranking Georgia as a leader among Eastern European and Central Asian countries. Overall, Georgia has evolved into a, an exemplary, I would say, democratic country in the wider region, and our efforts have been given positive appraisal uh, internationally. Uh, considering all the progress we have made today like never before, Georgia aspires to become a member of the European Union. As you know, on March 3rd, 2022, Georgia submitted a new membership application as a concrete response to the long-standing choice of the Georgian people. Last year, we, the European Council, recognized the European perspective for Georgia, which reaffirmed that Georgia's future is in the European Union. Uh, we are determined to swiftly progress on the EU accession path, and the candidate status is our next immediate milestone. Taking this into account, we have truly worked diligently to address almost all 12 recommendations which are outlined for granting Georgia the, the candidate status. Uh, our common history proves the, that multilateral cooperation and a rules-based international order has no alternative for the peace, prosperity and stability in the world. Georgia remains steadfast in upholding and promoting our shared principles and values, and we look forward to continued collaboration and progress within the Council of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irakli. And again, I remind everybody to stay within the time limits. And next is the TSOC of Ireland, Leo Varaskar. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Um, a year ago, Ireland assumed the presidency of the Committee of Ministers at a point of crisis for our continent, recalling that the Council was established in the wake of war, arguing that now, in the midst of war, leaders needed to meet again to recommit to the Council's founding values, to renew for a digital age, and to refocus energies on better supporting Kyiv, and to hold the Kremlin to account. Uh, Ireland is very proud to have laid the first steps on the road to Reykjavik, but it is Iceland that ultimately brought us together. And Prime Minister Jakob's daughter, Katrin, really want to thank you and your team in particular for your hospitality uh, and for your good organisation. A thousand years ago, Icelanders would used to meet, used to meet at the Luck Park. Not sure if I pronounced that right, but I know in English it means the law rock. And indeed, law was the bedrock of their society back then, as rule of law and the European Convention on Human Rights are for our democracies in Europe today. The Convention and the Court remain the conscience of Europe, and the Council of Europe is our legal community. For Ireland, they're also a big part of our peace process and are incorporated in the Good Friday Agreement whose 20th, 25th anniversary we celebrated last month. Ireland was among the first states to, to accept the court's compulsory jurisdiction, and we've always abided by it. 
Through the decades, we've had our share of judgments, some of which were historic, and several at their time were contentious. But all were respected, because a ruling ignored is a right infringed. Abiding by rulings against your state may not be easy, but in the long run, it turns out to be right. So we owe it to our citizens to ensure the implementation of the court's judgments is a legacy of this summit. Uh, colleagues, I believe we need to resource the Council of Europe politically and ensure more ministers at Committee of Ministers. We need to resource the Council financially as well. If we want Strasbourg to deliver, including for Ukraine, we must equip it and match our rhetoric and words today with resources tomorrow. So in the home of the Althingi, one of the world's oldest parliaments, let's promise once again to protect our democracies. By recommitting to our continent's conscience, by supporting Ukraine, and by doing the, these things, we reinforce the institutional rock on which all of our freedoms stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the Prime Minister of Liechtenstein, Daniel Ries. You have the floor. Thank you, Thoris. Excellencies, dear European friends around this um, huge round table. Over the last year, we have often heard that we currently find ourselves at a crossroad. The values of the Council of Europe, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law face multiple threats, including democratic backsliding, limitations to the freedom of expression, the disregard for the authority of the European Court of Human Rights, and a dangerous increase in gender-based violence. Tragically, we have seen what can happen when these threats escalate. Today, we stand united against Russia's brutal war against Ukraine. Let me reiterate Liechtenstein's solidarity with Ukraine and its people and emphasize our firm support for the register of damage. This is the first step towards accountability. At the same time, it remains of critical importance that the crime of aggression is investigated and prosecuted, and that all those responsible are brought to justice. This brutal war, however, also serves as a strong reminder not only of the importance of our common values, but it highlights their urgent necessity. As a geographically small state, Liechtenstein relies on the effective functioning of the international rules-based order. Collectively, we must do our utmost to preserve multilateralism. This summit here in Reykjavik offers the opportunity for us to recommit to our values and strengthen the Council of Europe. The Strasbourg Court is our strongest ally in this endeavour. As such, it acts as the principal safeguard to protect our values and to guarantee that Europe remains a continent of democratic societies guided by the rule of law. As member states, we have the obligation to ensure the full, effective and prompt execution of all judgments of the court and to respect its case law. Contrary actions undermine the authority and functioning of the Convention system, and they pose a dangerous threat to our entire European rule-based order. At this crucial crossroad, let us all choose the right path. Together, let us transform our commitments into actions. Excellencies, in Liechtenstein, we are well aware of the responsibility that is awaiting us regarding the implementation of the outcome of this summit after we will take over from Latvia in November this year. Rest assured that Liechtenstein will use its upcoming presidency to show that we are united by our values towards the future for the needs of us all. Thank you very much. So next we have uh, the Prime Minister of Portugal, uh, Mr. Antonio Costa. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank the Icelandic Presidency for the organization of this summit and uh, for the excellent and successful chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers. Europe and therefore the Council of Europe are living challenging moments. War 
has returned to our continent. We witness setbacks on democracy and on the respect of the rule of law. Human rights and its universality are being increasingly questioned. Populist, extremist, and racist ideologies are on the rise, spreading hate and disinformation. In face of this diversity, it is time for us to unite around our founding values, to unite for human rights, for, them, for democracy, and for rule of law, to unite in support of Ukraine and of accountability, to unite condemning the Russian aggression, to unite around the Council of Europe. The Council of Europe remains a unique organization, which plays a crucial role. It remains the reference body of co and core political community in our continent for the promotion of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And it's even more vital in the context of Russia's brutal, unjustified, and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. We stand with Ukraine and Ukrainian people and will continue to support them for as long as it necessary. The Council of Europe reacted swiftly to a situation which so ostensibly violates the rules of the organization, excluding Russia from the org for our organization was the adequate response. As further evidence is uncovered of violations of international humanitarian law, which may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity, accountability is essential. We welcome Council of Europe's ongoing efforts to ensure accountability for these violations and fully support the register of damage caused by the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. Dear colleagues, I would also like to express our support to the Reykjavik principles for democracy. They constitute an important standard for reference of us all. The Convention system with the European Court of Human Rights at its core is the crown jewel of the Council of Europe. The Court is the ultimate guardian of the human rights of citizens of Europe. Portugal is a friend of the Court and shares the need to enhance the tools for the supervision of the execution of court judgment. We also hope that the European Union will be able to accede in the near future of the European Convention of the Human Rights. The Court has also been playing a very relevant role in interpreting innovative issues and rights. In this regard, we look forward to the upcoming Court's decisions on environment and human rights, including the one on a case of put forward by a group of Portuguese young citizens. The promotion of the universal realization of economic, social and cultural rights is a top prior priority for Portugal. That is why we will continue to actively collaborate with the Committee of Social Rights and to implement the European Social Charter. Portugal is a strong supporter of the Council of Europe. This, the Council has a unique legal acquis setting the most advanced standards in the world, which we are committed to implement. From the Istanbul to Lanzarote Convention, but also looking forward to the Framework Convention on Artificial Intelligence and Human Rights that will be a groundbreaking piece of international law. Portugal will continue to be an active and committed member of this organization strongly advocating for the universal abolition of the death penalty, supporting the court and its independence, pushing for the recognition uh, of the human rights to a healthy environment also, also at the Council of Europe, being more ambitious on the way the Council of Europe relates with the na its neighbourhood, contributing to strengthen the role of the North-South Centre based in Lisbon. The purpose of the Council of Europe remains more relevant than ever. The summit is a decisive contribute to make it stronger, and I assure you, Portugal's commitment is stronger than ever. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Portugal. And next up is uh, Malta, the Prime Minister of Malta, Mr. Robert Tabela. You have the floor. Thank you for giving me the floor, Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear friends. Europe will be forged in crisis and will be the sum of the solutions adopted for those crises. John Monet was right. The first European political organization, the Council of Europe, was forged in the aftermath of the most devastating war on our continent and also in the midst of the catastrophic crisis that ensued. To 74 years later, we are again faced with a brutal war and an increasing number of crises emanating from it. A brutal war initiated by a former member state of this common European home that had committed to its values and subscribed to the promise of never again. A promise broken unilaterally by Russia through its illegal, unjustified and unprovoked acts of aggression against the Ukraine. For already 447 days, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine have been under a direct attack and at the receiving end of the most serious crimes under international law. It was not only fitting, therefore, but also necessary that we reconvened here today to unite for Ukraine to seek solutions for this horrible crisis, to reunite around our shared values which forged this organization, and to recommit to the pursuit of peace based upon justice and also international cooperation. For there can be no peace without justice, and no justice without accountability. That is why we need to continue supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes to ensure that all those responsible are held accountable and the victims' rights to truth, justice and reparations are realized. Madam President, concurrently with this major crisis, our continent is also faced with other separate crises for which we need to stand united and summon our political will to address them. I'm talking about climate change, first of all, for which we must scale up our efforts to prevent and minimize as much as possible its ravages. Migration, for which we must strengthen our fight against migrant trafficking and human smuggling and also increase our support to frontline member states such as ours, as well as also to those countries of origin and transit. transit and also the issue of democratic backsliding, for which we must uphold the timely Reykjavik principles for democracy. The rise of the anti-gender movement is another worrying challenge, for which we must double our efforts to counter its harmful rhetoric and also prioritize gender equality in all our work and at all levels. The Council of Europe has been pivotal in setting solid standards in the field of human rights, particularly through the system developed around its first ever convention, the European Convention on Human Rights. As a beating heart is central to sustaining life, so is the Convention to the Council's protection of human rights. We need to continually, continuously invest in it and provide it with the tangible and collective support necessary to ensure its long-term sustainability and effectiveness. We look forward in this respect to the European Union's accession to the Convention and to welcoming those democratic European countries willing to join it. Madam President, in conclusion, human rights, democracy and the rule of law are the core values that bring us together and that unite us. Let us make sure that we continue to respect, promote and protect them whilst never losing sight of what's on the other side of never again. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And next is the Prime Minister of Montenegro, Mr. Dritan Abazovic, please. Thank you very much, dear Prime Minister. And thank you for invitation and for this great event in Reykjavik. For Montenegro, this is the historical event because we are first time in this format of the Council after we get independence. And I want to underline that uh, it's a great pleasure to be in Iceland because Iceland is the first country which recognizes independent Montenegro. Montenegro staying by Ukraine from the 
day one of this aggression of Russia Federation, and we will give everything to support our friends until the end, until the win of this war. Because Ukraine, in the end of the day, should win for all of us, for Europe, and for the protecting of the free choice of how one country wants to be organized, what they want, in which organization to participate, and how the sovereignty and territorial integrity should be protected. Montenegro is the country in the Western Balkans, and a few decades ago we have the very big problems with the security. We have the wars around us, fortunately not in our territory. So we should immediately start to think about the reconstruction and rebuilding of the Ukraine. We should not wait for the end of the world or of the war. So we need to see how we can develop the country. And I want to underline that it's very good that Ukraine working hard to promote another values inside of country, which is fighting against corruption, organized crime. And in that sense, make possible that the end of this war uh, come in the bet better circumstances in the context of this rebuilding. So, for Montenegro, it's very acceptable to join every initiative, with also this initiative for the register of, of, of damage, but any another initiative when we can give the small contribution for the rebuilding of Ukraine. I want to inform you that Montenegro, like a small country, today is the country which has the most Ukrainian people per capita. 5% of our population in this moment are Ukrainian people. Everybody feels very safe and very comfortable in our country. And what I also want to say, that in Montenegro, in this moment, even that we are very strong in section against Russia Federation, we have also citizens of Russia. Not too much, but we have the citizens of Russia. And in Montenegro, there is no uh, problem between, between Ukrainian and Russians. I'm talking about the citizen, about the tourists, about the visitors of the, of, the, of the country. So, we are ready to continue our support. And uh, I hope that these kind of meetings helping to just underline one again, one more time again, that solidarity and unity is the way to win the war. And invite every single country of the Europe to stay united in this, protecting of universal values, promote good politics, good governments, fighting against corruption, freedom of media everywhere in our continent. In the end of the day, it's not a matter how big one country is. It's important that we, when we are united, we can win. When we are dissolved, we can lose altogether. So thank you very much for this great meeting. And we are ready to see how, what, how is going implementation of the, of the conclusion of this summit with our friends from Latvia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dritan. And next is the Prime Minister of Netherlands, Mark Rutte. Please, Mark, the floor is yours. Dear Catherine, uh, esteemed uh, colleagues, um, let's remind ourselves again that it is this month um, marking 75 years since the foundations of the Council of Europe were laid at the Congress of Europe uh, in The Hague. The aim of that historic gathering was simple, to ensure peace and prosperity. And this was after a devastating war that cost millions of lives and left our continent in ruins. The participants in 1949 shared a firm conviction that armed conflict in Europe must become a thing of the past. There can be no doubt that a lot has been achieved since then. But nor can there be any doubt that the European community of values we created back then is under siege today. So this summit couldn't be more timely. Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine 
goes against everything the Council of Europe and its member states stand for. Freedom, democracy, human rights and the rule of law, these are our common values. They need protecting when threatened and defending when attacked. The government of the Netherlands believes that Russia must be held accountable for all the pain and misery it is inflicting on the Ukrainian people. Not only with regard to war crimes and human rights violations, but also for the damage and destruction it has caused. So I fully agree with our Secretary General and others who called for the establishment of a register of damage. And we are proud that the register will be housed in The Hague, the international city of peace and justice and the legal capital of the world. But let us be frank today. Let's tell it like it is. Human rights, democracy and rule of law are backsliding in other parts of Europe too. And that is a serious cause for concern. Whenever and wherever media freedom, gender equality, LGBTIQ rights and the independence of judiciary are under pressure, we simply must take action. Indeed, as we have concluded here in Reykjavik, we must unite around our values. And here I believe that the European Convention on Human Rights and the work of the court, they remain crucial. Let us acknowledge and cherish the strengths of the foundations we have built together, including the institutions that support the Council of Europe, like the Parliamentary Assembly and the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. In concluding, let us make sure our continent remains what it has been for so long, a beacon, a champion of human rights, peace and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And next is the Prime Minister of North Macedonia, Dimitar Kovashevsky. Please. Excellencies, dear colleagues, we have gathered in Reykjavik to demonstrate unity, solidarity, and commitment to our shared values in the areas of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in the face of the unprecedented aggression against our fellow member state Ukraine. The Russian aggression against Ukraine is a blatant violation of the international law and the rule-based international order, which has shaken the existing multilateral structures. We still are convinced that multilateralism is the only way to mobilize collective response to wars, crises, emergencies, and unparalleled challenges of various nature. Ukraine only wanted to choose its future path and allies. We did the same when we demonstrated our firm solidarity and promptly expelled the Russian Federation from the Council of Europe. We stood and are still united in requesting accountability for the crimes committed. We also started thinking about what we do good in Strasbourg and where we can improve. And we do a lot of good. Starting as a peace project in 1949, the Council of Europe has developed into a beacon of hope for millions of Europeans through the European Convention of Human Rights. Its norms and standards have contributed to improving lives of our citizens. Today, more than ever, it is important that Europe remains united and Europe will not be united whole free and at a peace without the Balkans, fully integrated in the European family. North Macedonia and Albania deserve to move forward and together because when your neighbors move forward, you too move forward. We should not allow any room for influence from third parties, especially from Russia, and in the heart of the Balkans, which is the heart of Europe. North Macedonia fully endorses the summit declaration and all annexes. We believe that they ensure a solid agenda for addressing together with our partner organizations, in particular the European Union, the problems and concerns we share. As OSCE chair and as member of NATO, we shall continue to demonstrate our firm commitment to freedom, peace, prosperity and security in Europe, and our commitment to Ukraine in particular, as we have done so far. I would like to thank the Icelandic presidency 
for their efforts in making the summit a success and wish the incoming Latvian presidency the same stamina and commitment. Let me conclude by saying that the discourse widely used by Bulgaria towards North Macedonia is unfortunately very similar to the discourse of the Russian Federation towards Ukraine. It is unacceptable that false and ungrounded accusations are misused for political purposes and at this crucial juncture of the history of Europe. North Macedonia is internationally recognized as a successful model for functional multi-ethnic society and democracy. All international human rights reports confirm this fact. The accusations stated at this summit by the representative of Bulgaria are totally ungrounded and are coming from a country that disrespects judgments of the European Court of Human Rights and the Council of Europe standards in the area of human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitar. Maintenant, c'est le Premier ministre de Luxembourg, M. Xavier Pettel. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Première ministre de l'Islande, <rire> chère Catherine. Tout d'abord, un grand merci de nous recevoir ici. Je dois vous dire que les réunions hier ont été bien intéressante car nous avons une dynamique dans le groupe que j'avais la chance avec le président roumain de pouvoir présider, d'avoir vraiment un échange. Et je pense que l'échange est ce qui est le plus important. Euh, être membre pour moi euh, du Conseil de l'Europe n'est pas un service club. On n'est pas ici un service club où on se voit une fois de temps en temps et puis euh, on, on discute et puis on se dit ce qu'on ferait comme bonne action. La volonté de cette, pour moi de cette union, de ce Conseil de l'Europe, c'est de partager des valeurs. Et de temps en temps on a tendance à l'oublier. On a tendance à l'oublier, même au sein de notre, de notre Assemblée. Euh, on le voit que dans certains pays, euh, euh, la justice ne peut plus faire son travail normalement, on voit que la presse ne peut pas faire son travail normalement, on voit que des minorités sont poussées dans un coin, et aujourd'hui, comme c'est la journée Idaho, et moi-même, euh, euh, en faisant partie de la famille euh, euh, hétéroclite de, de, de l'Idaho, je tiens à dire que euh, l'homosexualité n'est pas un choix. Hein, mais l'homophobie en est un. Alors certains gouvernements qui sont homophobes ou certains politiciens, je tiens à dire que c'est leur choix. Tandis que d'être gay, c'est déjà la plus difficile décision de s'accepter soi-même. Et c'est la même chose pour les autres, les religions, les opinions et quoi que ce soit. Donc la tolérance doit pour moi être cette épine dorsale qu'est le Conseil de l'Europe. Et donc je tiens à le rappeler pour tous ceux qui sont aussi autour de la table, ce n'est pas juste venir boire une tasse de café, faire une belle photo de famille, mais aussi défendre ses valeurs 12 mois par an et pas juste quand on est ici à Reykjavik aujourd'hui. Première chose. Après, la deuxième chose, euh, je suis très content d'avoir vu notre, notre ami Biélorussie, de Biélorussie, Svetlana, car on a tendance à l'oublier. Vous savez, on a tendance, c'est typique politique. On parle de, de ce que l'on voit tous les jours à la télé, et du coup, l'opposition en Biélorussie qui a, vient d'être condamnée, donc, et elle défend encore les valeurs. Donc je tiens vraiment à remercier aussi Svetlana Tichanovskaya euh, d'avoir trouvé la présence ici, pour qu'on n'oublie pas. Parce qu'on a tendance, c'est humain, hein, une fois que c'est plus tous les jours en première page, on oublie. C'est le risque. Et c'est pour ça aussi que l'Ukraine, on doit, on doit tous les jours, tous les jours se rappeler ce qui se passe en Ukraine, tous les jours. Et pas d'un coup que ça passe après la météo, dans nos JT, d'ici quelques semaines ou quelques mois, si ça dure encore. Il est important de savoir que cette guerre qui a lieu en Ukraine est quelque chose qui est contre nous tous, contre nos valeurs. Et ce que je vous ai décrit tout à l'heure, contre cette volonté de construire quelque chose aussi ensemble. Donc, pour moi, la paix, les droits de l'homme, l'état de droit, c'est ce qui doit nous, nous allier et ce qui doit nous, nous garder. On doit avoir une Europe des valeurs, pas une Europe sans valeurs, car dans ce cas-là, on, on, on fait ce que les autres veulent. Et je regrette aujourd'hui aussi, je dois le dire, parce que comme je ne suis pas toujours le plus grand diplomate, que des pays ne signent pas ce que l'on veut faire. Car tous entre nous, on a déjà eu des situations où on a besoin de solidarité. Et ici, ce n'est pas dire si on est pour ou contre la Russie, cette déclaration. C'est dire tout simplement qu'on n'accepte pas ce qui n'est pas normal. Et qu'on est d'accord de se mettre autour d'une table et de retenir ce qui n'est pas normal, que l'impunité ne doit pas être la règle. C'est tout ce que l'on demande. Donc que ces six pays qui hésitent à signer réfléchissent. Car dans le passé et dans l'avenir, ils seront bien contents s'ils peuvent compter aussi sur les autres. Merci, Xavier. Um, and now we go over to the Holy See, Pietro Parolin. Madam President, I am pleased to offer you and all uh, here present the most cordial greetings of Pope Francis, 
while expressing my sincere gratitude for the invitation and the opportunity to address this summit. The declaration of this summit recalls that the Council of Europe is a peace project. Unfortunately, the war in Ukraine shows us that the passionate quest of a politics of community and the strengthening of multilateral relations seems a wistful memory from a distant past. We seem to be witnessing the sorry sunset of that choral dream of peace. Therefore, in the spirit of the founders of this organization and together with Pope Francis, we should ask ourselves, while thinking not least of war-torn Ukraine, where are creative efforts for peace? We cannot accept passively that the war of aggression in that tormented country continues. We must always keep in mind the Ukrainian people who suffer or die. This is the time to take action and establish a definitive and just peace in Ukraine and in all the other so-called grey areas of Europe. I assure you that the Holy See will continue to do its part. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you so much. And next we go over to Azerbaijan, to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, please. Madam Chairperson, Excellencies, I wish to start by thanking the congratulating and congratulating our host, the Government of Iceland, for the excellent organization of the fourth summit of the heads of state and government of the Council of Europe in Reykjavik. I also congratulate Latvia for assuming chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers. The summit takes place amidst serious deterioration of security situation across the European continent. Azerbaijan deeply regrets that the ongoing crisis in Ukraine continues to undermine peace and security in Europe. Azerbaijan stands for the earliest settlement on the basis of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. The dire humanitarian consequences require expedient measures to alleviate the sufferings of civilians. Proceeding from this understanding, Azerbaijan continues to render humanitarian assistance to the people of Ukraine. Excellencies, since gaining its independence, Azerbaijan has made a long journey, transforming from a country imposed with the security challenges on its own soil into a contributor to the global security. Having put an end to the armed conflict with Armenia in 2020, Azerbaijan has been actively working to secure a lasting peace with Armenia, despite the long years of suffering, deprivation and devastation that the people of Azerbaijan were subjected to as a result of the 30-year-long military occupation. The end of the conflict offers an opportunity and real prospects for building peace, consolidating stability, ensuring peaceful coexistence, advancing the reconciliation agenda and investing in economic development and cooperation. With this understanding, Azerbaijan has offered post-conflict normalization agenda to Armenia. The both sides are engaged in negotiating the text of a bilateral agreement that will form the framework of interstate relations based on the mutual recognition of and respect for each other's sovereignty, territorial integrity and inviolability of state borders. Despite a series of negotiations over past months, the progress still remains short of our expectation. Azerbaijan values their contribution of the international community to the normalization process and in this context appreciates the efforts taken within the Council of Europe on confidence building between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Along with bilateral interstate normalization with Armenia, Azerbaijan has now embarked on a large-scale post-conflict rehabilitation, reconstruction and reintegration efforts to eliminate the harsh consequences of 30-year-long military occupation of our territories. These aims at ensuring the right of hundreds of thousands of Azerbaijanis to eventually exercise their violated right to safe and dignified return to their homes and peaceful coexistence of the conflict-affected citizens of Azerbaijan. The massive contamination of territories of Azerbaijan with landmines and other explosives accompanied by the continued refusal of Armenia to share all maps of the mined areas in the major impediment and possess serious humanitarian threat, indiscriminately planted mines continue to take lives of almost on a daily basis. Azerbaijan is also determined in terms of reintegration of ethnic Armenian re residents of the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan into the political, legal, economic and social framework of Azerbaijan as equal citizens. 
the Constitution and the national legislation of Azerbaijan, along with the international documents that were party to, in particular, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities provide the solid ground. As we embarked on healing the wounds of the past conflict, ensuring justice with respect to serious war crimes and crimes against humanity is of vital importance. In this regard, it is of paramount importance to shed light on the fate of about 4,000 Azerbaijanis who went missing due to the conflict. Madam Chair, Azerbaijan continues to regard the Council of Europe as an important pillar of pan-European architecture to promote security and development through upholding human rights, democracy and the rule of law. I thank you. Thank you so much. And next is the Vice Foreign Minister for Germany, please. Excellenz, meine Damen und Herren, von diesem Gipfel geht ein sehr starkes Signal aus. Wir sind vereint für ein starkes Europa der Menschenrechte, der Demokratie und der Rechtsstaatlichkeit. Wir treten geschlossen ein für die Grundwerte unseres friedlichen Zusammenlebens und der Prosperität in Europa. Wir stehen für ein regelbasiertes Miteinander, das sich auf die Stärke des Rechtes gründet und nicht auf dem Recht des Stärkeren. Russlands barbarischer und völkerrechtswidriger Angriffskrieg gegen die Ukraine hat die europäische Friedensordnung in ihren Grundfesten erschüttert. Vor dem Hintergrund der Zeitenwende müssen wir entschlossen und geschlossen für die Werte und Prinzipien eintreten, für die der Europarat steht. Was bedeutet das konkret? Erstens müssen wir der Ukraine in ihrem Freiheitskampf stark und fest zur Seite stehen, in allen Bereichen. Das hat für Deutschland Priorität. Ich begrüße daher, dass die Unterstützung für die Ukraine eine zentrale Rolle auf unserem Gipfeltreffen in unseren Beschlüssen einnimmt. Russland muss für seinen brutalen Angriffskrieg zur Rechenschaft gezogen werden. Dafür müssen die Kriegsschäden in der Ukraine dokumentiert werden. Und das neue Schadensregister des Europarates ist dazu ein wesentlicher Beitrag. Deshalb haben wir uns für das Schadensregister eingesetzt und sind ihm beigetreten. Der Europarat wird auch beim Wiederaufbau der Ukraine helfen, auch auf dem Weg zum EU-Beitritt. Zweitens ist es erforderlich, dass wir den Europarat als Hüter der Menschenrechte, der Demokratie und der Rechtsstaatlichkeit in ganz Europa stärken. Die Welt hat sich seit der Gründung des Europarates gewandelt, genauso auch die Bedrohung für die Menschenrechte. Dazu gehören heutzutage auch die Klimakrise und künstliche Intelligenz, auch die schleichende Erosion demokratischer Standards. Wir müssen den Europarat handlungsfähiger machen. Er braucht zeitgemäße Instrumente für die aktuellen Herausforderungen. Beim Eintritt in den Europarat haben wir ein Bekenntnis abgegeben. Zu den Grundwerten des Europarates, zur Europäischen Menschenrechtskonvention und auch dazu, die Urteile des Europäischen Gerichtshofs für Menschenrechte umzusetzen. Dieses Bekenntnis erneuern wir heute feierlich. Wir wollen auch den vom Europarat geschaffenen Rechtsraum vervollständigen. Deutschland tritt daher für den zugigen Beitritt der Europäischen Union zur Europäischen Menschenrechtskonvention und auch zur Istanbul-Konvention ein. Drittens. Unser Bekenntnis beinhaltet auch, dass wir den Europarat finanziell ausreichend ausstatten. Deutschland wird den Europarat auch in diesem Sinne stärken. Über unseren Pflichtbeitrag hinaus werden wir dem Europarat in diesem Jahr 10 Millionen Euro zusätzlich zur Verfügung stellen. Meine Damen und Herren, klar ist, der Europarat wird gebraucht, heute mehr denn je. Dieser Gipfel stärkt den Europarat. Es ist unsere gemeinsame Aufgabe, die Erklärung des Gipfels jetzt in die Tat umzusetzen. Packen wir es gemeinsam an. Thank you so much. And now we go over to the Vice Foreign Minister of Monaco. Switzerland. Of Switzerland. Okay, we are not going to Monaco and I'm so sorry. <laughs> we will get to Monaco at some place. <laughs> But Vice Foreign Minister of Switzerland. Madame la Présidente, Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs. La Suisse remercie l'Islande pour son hospitalité et l'excellente organisation de notre sommet. 
La Suisse a été convaincue dès le début de son potentiel pour donner un nouvel élan politique au Conseil de l'Europe. Aujourd'hui, nous témoignons de notre unité autour de l'Ukraine, victime d'une violation flagrante du droit international. La Suisse réitère sa condamnation de l'agression militaire de la Russie contre l'Ukraine avec la plus grande fermeté et appelle la Russie à cesser toutes les opérations de combat et à retirer sans délai ses troupes du territoire ukrainien. La Suisse s'engage en collaboration avec la communauté internationale pour la reconstruction de l'Ukraine. Elle a l'intention d'adhérer au registre des dommages après avoir mené sa procédure d'approbation nationale. La mise sur pied rapide du registre sur les dommages causés à l'Ukraine témoigne de la capacité du Conseil de l'Europe à jouer un rôle clé pour l'obligation de rendre ses comptes ainsi que pour la reconstruction de l'Ukraine. Dans le nouveau paradigme européen, il s'agit également de démontrer que nous sommes unis autour de nos valeurs. Le système de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme nous a permis de construire un ordre social européen basé sur le droit. La mise en œuvre inconditionnelle de ces arrêts définitifs en est la principale composante. Enfin, nous nous montrons aujourd'hui unis pour l'Europe. La vocation pan-européenne du Conseil de l'Europe nous rassemble au sein d'une communauté politique, sociale, géographique et de valeurs. Nous devons continuer à dépasser nos différences, dialoguer et nous concentrer sur ce qui nous rapproche, à savoir notre attachement aux valeurs qui sont celles du Conseil de l'Europe, la démocratie, les droits humains et l'état de droit. Alors que nous venons de célébrer le 60e anniversaire de l'adhésion de la Suisse au Conseil de l'Europe, la Suisse souhaite capitaliser sur ce que nous avons développé ensemble à Strasbourg afin d'investir dans le futur de notre continent. Ce sommet nous permet aujourd'hui de le faire et confirme que des rencontres à ce niveau devraient être plus fréquentes. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Merci, Madame. And now we go to the Foreign Minister of Spain. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Hablaré en español. Nos reunimos hoy en Reykjavik en un momento crítico en el que ofrecemos nuestra solidaridad y apoyo a Ucrania en respuesta a la guerra de agresión trágica e ilegal llevada a cabo por la Federación Rusa en violación de su soberanía, de su independencia y de su integridad territorial. España, una vez más, condena esta barbarie, contraria al derecho internacional y a nuestros principios, los principios del Consejo de Europa, y reitera su apoyo incondicional a Ucrania. Apoyaremos a Ucrania el tiempo que sea necesario y también mostramos nuestro apoyo a Moldavia y a Georgia y saludamos la presencia de Svetlana Tijanoskaya, que representa un Belarus bajo los principios en los que creemos en el Consejo de Europa. Tenemos que exigir su responsabilidad al agresor ruso y para alcanzar ese objetivo, el establecimiento de un registro de daños del que España es participante fundador es un primer paso para compensarlos en un futuro cercano. No puede haber impunidad. Desafortunadamente, la agresión rusa nos recuerda que 74 años después de su fundación, la labor del Consejo de Europa sigue siendo esencial en la defensa del Estado de Derecho, de la democracia, de los derechos humanos, principios por los que tenemos que seguir trabajando cada día. De esta cumbre tenemos que salir también fortaleciendo, por un lado, la Convención de Derechos Humanos con las que España está plenamente comprometida, como muestra el hecho de que seamos uno de los Estados con menos condenas del Tribunal Europeo de Derechos Humanos. Pero también tenemos que salir haciendo frente a nuevos retos surgidos en estos tiempos de cambio. La emergencia climática, las nuevas tecnologías, el impulso a la igualdad de género, 
la lucha contra la violencia contra las mujeres que consagra el Convenio de Estambul, el apoyo a los jóvenes cada vez más importante, la promoción de los derechos sociales para que también avancen nuestros ciudadanos materialmente. Y apoyamos firmemente la adhesión de la Unión Europea a la Convención de Derechos Humanos. España seguirá apoyando los esfuerzos del Consejo de Europa por favorecer un continente y un mundo más democrático, más próspero, más libre. Por eso apoyamos también la proyección de los principios del Consejo de Europa más allá de nuestras fronteras, especialmente en los países vecinos y en aquellos que comparten nuestros valores, incluida Iberoamérica, con la que trabaja de manera efectiva la Comisión de Venecia. Quiero felicitar a la presidencia islandesa, especialmente por esta cumbre, y desear muchos éxitos a la próxima presidencia letona. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Gracias. And then I give the floor to the foreign minister of Sweden. Tobias, please. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking Iceland, Kathleen and Thordis, and also the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Maria, for your impressive efforts in preparing this important summit where we stand united for Ukraine. Today, we are facing a historic challenge in Europe. Russia's full-scale invasion against Ukraine has brought war, misery and vast human suffering. It is abundantly clear that the norms and values with which the Council of Europe was founded on, the very same values that were called upon in the Vienna Declaration, must not be taken for granted. We have gathered here today because these norms and values must be upheld. This summit sends a clear message that the members of the Council of Europe stand united in our unrelenting and continued support to Ukraine. We stand united also in the unequivocal commitment to the values that this organization was founded upon, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. The European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights are the ultimate guarantors of human rights right across the continent. The Council of Europe has a challenging task ahead, that much is clear, but this challenge is also an opportunity and one we must seize during this summit. We have the opportunity now to ensure that this organization, which sits at the very heart of the European security architecture, can continue its essential work today, tomorrow and in the future for a united Europe. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at this summit we once again commit to continue our unabated support to Ukraine. The establishment of a register of damage caused by the Russian aggression constitutes a significant step forward to ensure that Russia bears the legal consequences of its flagrant violations of international law. Russia must compensate Ukraine for the massive damage it, it has caused. That's the law. Sweden was one of the founding participants of the Register of Damage, and we remain firm in our commitment to achieve accountability and justice for Ukraine. Standing united in upholding the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine remains the top priority for Sweden, as well as full accountability for all crimes committed in connection with Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. These crimes must not, not go unpunished. As President, of the EU Council, one of our main priorities has been to make sure we provide as much support as possible to Ukraine, politically, financially and militarily, and increasing the pressure on Russia. And this summit shows that we, the Member States of the Council of Europe, will stand with Ukraine as long as it takes. We remain committed to the visions from the Vienna Declaration to Europe, united in our shared values of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, maintenant, c'est Monaco, le ministre, le ministre des Affaires étrangères, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. 18 ans après sa dernière édition, ce quatrième sommet revêt un caractère exceptionnel. Il a pour ambition de repenser la mission du Conseil de l'Europe au sein d'une architecture multilatérale et d'une gouvernance mondiale bouleversée par l'agression de la Russie envers l'Ukraine. 
Je tiens ici à exprimer le soutien indéfectible de la principauté de Monaco à l'Ukraine, à sa souveraineté et à son intégrité territoriale dans ses frontières internationalement reconnues. Nous saluons à cet égard la création d'un registre pour documenter et enregistrer les preuves et réclamations résultant de l'agression russe auxquelles le gouvernement princier a décidé d'adhérer en qualité de participant. Il nous revient plus que jamais de réaffirmer nos valeurs pour une Europe unie. Le Conseil de l'Europe s'est construit sur la base d'un engagement commun en faveur des droits de l'homme, de l'état de droit et de la démocratie. Les éléments fondateurs du droit international en vigueur sont intangibles et ne sauraient être remis en question. Excellence, en ces temps troublés, nous sommes appelés à recentrer nos objectifs afin de renforcer la gouvernance démocratique. Nous faisons nôtre les principes de Reykjavik qui nous engagent à promouvoir l'indépendance et la séparation des pouvoirs et à assurer la participation de tous à la vie démocratique. À cet effet, nous bénéficions de précieux outils, un socle d'instruments juridiques ouverts aux États membres et non membres, des mécanismes de suivi rigoureux, des activités de coopération technique en Europe et dans les régions voisines. Mais aussi et surtout, la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme constitue un rempart incontournable contre l'affaiblissement des valeurs promues par le Conseil de l'Europe. Nous devons soutenir et défendre son travail. Au nom du respect des droits fondamentaux et des libertés individuelles, il est essentiel que nous concentrions nos efforts pour assurer l'exécution rapide et efficace de ces arrêts. Si nous voulons être unis pour l'Europe, nous devons aussi être unis dans l'action, c'est-à-dire renforcer le dialogue avec d'autres organisations internationales. Cette synergie, indispensable, doit être développée en nous appuyant sur les domaines d'excellence de chacune de nos institutions. Pour être efficace, la protection des droits de l'homme doit en effet rester cohérente, notamment en termes de mécanismes de suivi. La conclusion des négociations du projet d'accord révisé sur l'adhésion de l'Union européenne à la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme est également très prometteuse. Mesdames et Messieurs, en 2024, Monaco célébrera les 20 ans de son adhésion au Conseil de l'Europe. Vous pouvez compter sur notre ferme volonté pour promouvoir nos valeurs communes au service de la stabilité et de la cohésion de notre continent. Avant de conclure, Permettez-moi d'exprimer nos remerciements sincères et chaleureux à la présidence islandaise et notre plein soutien à la présidence lettonne en 30. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci, madame. And now for the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey. Thank you, madam president, excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by expressing our gratitude to all for standing with us in solidarity in the aftermath of the earthquake disasters. Turkish people and Turkish state will never forget that. During these tough times, we felt the profound solidarity and the helping hand of our friends from all, all around the world. Excellencies, the Council of Europe is our common home. We established this organization as a peace project based on the rule of law, democracy, and human rights. Today, we are tr trying to defend our common home in the face of war on our continent. On this occasion, we reiterate once again Turkey's full support to the sovereignty, independence, territory integrity, and unity of Ukraine. New and evolving geostrategic developments require us to further strengthen our common values and principles and remain united. Today, we witness a moment in history. This summit constitutes a vital opportunity to show our commitment to the principles and standards that we have established together over the years. It's equally an important occasion for the revitalizing our spirit of cooperation and solidarity. We are proud of our organization and of its strong expertise, yet, The Council of Europe is more than that. It's about strategic priorities agreed by all of us. That's also the reason why, as member states, based on our common standards and principles, we should be able to provide answers to current and future challenges we face. Xenophobia, 
racism, antisemitism, Islamophobia, nativism, hate speech and hate crime are all symptoms of the same disease in today's world. Regrettably, in today's world, Europe, we still witness the burning of the Holy Quran. We should not shy away from calling these despicable acts as hate crimes and they must be duly addressed. Pushbacks, systemic violations of rights of migrants and refugees continue to cause major concern as well. Let's remind ourselves that the European Convention on Human Rights and the Statute of the Council of Europe remain the foundation on which we establish our democratic societies. Standards and principles are there for every human being. Excellencies, we stand for a stronger Council of Europe as vital mechanism of European cooperation. We should strengthen more than ever our spirit of cooperation and integration. We should remember that our democracy, our security and our prosperity are interdependent. Turkey remains committed to do its share for a Council of Europe which is united around our values, united to face our common challenges, united for Ukraine and united around the vision of equality and cooperation. Let me conclude by thanking Icelandic presidency for hosting this historic summit, for amazing hospitality shown to us, and by reiterating our full support to the upcoming Latvian presidency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tur uh, Turkey. And now to the Minister of State of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Prime Minister. Jakob Stoder, Secretary Boric, good afternoon, and Gothan Endaya. Um, amid Mr. Putin's heinous war in Ukraine and the growing threats to our shared values of human rights, rule of law, and democracy, it is this Council that continues to demonstrate its worth as a platform for action. The Register of Damage is an important step an important step in ensuring accountability for Ukrainians whose lives and livelihoods have been torn apart by Russian aggression. And I'm delighted that the United Kingdom is a founding participant in the register and equally delighted that our Prime Minister, Mr. Sunak, signed this yesterday. This comes alongside the Prime Minister's announcement two days ago that we will supply a new long-range systems and military training to Ukraine in support for the brave country of Ukraine. Our support for Ukraine remains steadfast. Next month, we will galvanize international investment in reconstruction, as together with Ukraine, we host the next recovery conference in London, building on the 220 million pounds of humanitarian assistance we have already provided. At this summit, this, we will rightly focus on both current and future challenges and we must acknowledge the real threats to democracy right on our doorstep in Europe. It will be a time for governments to come together, but also, importantly, the private sector. The Reykjavik principles of democracy are a bulwark against these threats, setting out the core values upon which we stand against all tyranny. The United Kingdom also recognises the important role of the European Court of Human Rights alongside our domestic systems in securing these important rights and freedoms. Meanwhile, of course, collectively, we cannot ignore the growing issue of irregular migration, and our collective response must focus on tackling criminal groups as well as protecting and supporting victims. Finally, the United Kingdom is taking ambitious action to deliver a cleaner and greener world, and we welcome the Council's consideration of how we may define the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Madam Prime Minister, the challenges we face together are immense, they are great. But so too, as we've seen today again, amongst all our partners and friends, is our strength and our unity. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next is the permanent representative of the United States of America to the United Nations and member of, presidents, uh, of the President's Cabinet. Please. Thank you very much. Let me start by uh, stating very categorically that in the wake of the Second World War, two major multilateral institutions were founded with the express purpose of preventing a recurrence of these horrors, 
the United Nations and the Council of Europe. And I come here today as the United States representative for one of those institutions in support of another. Right now, we face a striking challenge to the Council of Europe's core principles, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Russia's war against Ukraine is an affront in, to all three of these principles. Russia invaded a sovereign, democratic country. Members of Russia's forces and other Russian officials have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity. And Russia has run roughshod over the rule of law. And that is why we enthusiastically join the Council of Europe's Register of Damage. We will join as a founding associate member and plan to provide, working with Congress, initial voluntary funding to support the register as part of our assistance to Ukraine. Russia's damages must be documented so that these, those responsible are held accountable and so that the world sees what responsible nations do. Can we demonstrate once and for all that democracies deliver for their people? I believe we can. After all, people around the world, from Moscow to Managua, from Beijing to Tehran, are seeing how authoritarian regimes are choosing corruption and control over care and competence. Together, let us continue to stand on the front lines of freedom, and let us continue our close and enduring cooperation from climate to cyber crimes to counterterrorism to make the world a better, freer, more just place for us all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we go to the special envoy of Canada to Europe. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Le Canada partageant tant de belles choses avec le Conseil de l'Europe. Nous partageons aussi deux langues officielles, l'anglais et le français, et donc je vais alterner entre ces deux langues. Le Conseil de l'Europe se gardien mieux cette conscience de la démocratie et des droits en Europe et au-delà. Nous a soumis plusieurs enjeux fondamentaux en son quatrième sommet en 75 ans. Le Canada veut souligner que ces enjeux démocratiques, géostratégiques et écologiques sont liés, car il est difficile de faire progresser la démocratie et les droits quand les écosystèmes sont en mauvaise santé. Alors que le fléau de la guerre est de retour sur le sol européen, qu'il nous faut soutenir l'Ukraine indéfectiblement, que la démocratie et les droits sont mis en cause en Europe et ailleurs, Voilà que la planète ne peut plus nous suivre, que les écosystèmes sont à bout de souffle, que les changements climatiques vont tout empirer et que l'eau vient à manquer ou à déborder. Le Canada, hein, au moment où on se parle, des inondations et des sécheresses. As humanity must reconcile its development with the capacities of the planet, democracies are experiencing a key moment where they seek to regroup, to better promote their values, without cutting ties with other regimes and recreating a new Cold War. During such a delicate transition, Canada, a well-established democracy, a NATO ally, an EU strategic partner, a cutting-edge economy, in fact, Canada, the most European of non-European countries, Canada reiterates its full support for the Council of Europe. And c'est pourquoi le Canada est fier de devenir membre fondateur associé du registre des dommages qui contribuera à ce que la Russie soit tenue responsable de ses actions criminelles et illégales. Nous soutenons également les documents adoptés lors du sommet, la déclaration sur la situation des enfants ukrainiens par laquelle nous condamnons les abus et violations par la Russie, les principes de Reykjavik pour la démocratie qui réitèrent le rôle essentiel du Conseil de l'Europe le document du Conseil pour les droits et l'environnement, ainsi que celui soulignant l'importance de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme. It is alongside the Council of Europe that Canada will always be better equipped to promote democracy, human rights and sustainable development in Europe and with Europe in the world. Thank you very much. Merci du fond du cœur. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we have the Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
First, on behalf of President López Obrador, I want to thank you for the invitation to Mexico to this important summit. It is imperative that in these complex times, we continue to promote and to strengthen the values of the Council of Europe, the promotion of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. We thank Iceland for hosting us and congratulate them on an extraordinary coordination job. Uh, we congratulate you on the um, organization of this summit, which has been a very successful summit. We appreciate the initiative of the Irish and Icelandic presidencies and the decision of the Committee of Ministers to hold the fourth summit in the context of the 73rd anniversary of the organization. Mexico and the Council of Europe have an important relation. On 1st December 1999, my country was accepted as a permanent observer and is the only Latin American country that has this status. I am honored to be here as a Mexican and as a Latin American. Mexico appreciates the value of the wake of the Council of Europe to leverage at the national level the protection of human rights, the rule of law, and democracy, as well as the role of the working groups to strengthen Mexican institutions. Mexico's participation in the Council of Europe has contributed to finding solutions to common problems which can only be solved through consensus and international cooperation. Mexico actively participates in legal instruments of the Council which are of the foremost importance, such as death penalty, human rights, and democracy and the rule of law. We highlight our full membership in the Venice Convention and our observer status in the European Commission against racism and intolerance, positioning Mexico as the first non-European countries to adopt and promote the No Hate Speech campaign. Our relationship has expanded in different areas and strengthened over the years. On the 7th of October 2020, the Mexico Council of Europe Strategic Partnership was formalized. Mexico is committed to inaugurate an innovative a new area in this relation with the Council of Europe. The presence of this delegation in the summit is a proof of this. We embrace the declaration of the summit, and as a strategic partner, Mexico hopes to enhance its collaboration, reaffirming its commitment to international law and building collective solutions to global challenges. In line with this, Mexico has condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine and has underlined several times the importance of dedicating every possible effort to achieve peace through diplomacy. I tr trust that through inclusive dialogue, and, and, the results the of the summit up. will continue to the leadership of the Council of Europe in building, building a better future. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very sorry, but I will be very strict on the time now because now time has, uh, the time has come that we're approaching 12 o'clock and we still have several people on our speakers list. So I need to remind all of you to be very mindful of the time limits because we have all traveled here to Iceland and I think it's only fair that everybody gets to have their say. So now to the, uh, but thank you to Mexico and now to the ambassador of Andorra. Merci beaucoup, ma, Madame la Présidente. Je serai bref. Per, Permettez-moi tout d'abord de remercier les autorités, les autorités islandaises pour l'accueil chaleureux que nous ont réservé ici à Reykjavik. L'Andorre tient à réitérer sa ferme condamnation de l'agression de la Fédération de Russie contre l'Ukraine. C'est précisément parce que nos valeurs les plus profondes sont bafouées que nous devons réaffirmer notre identité et préserver plus que jamais les valeurs essentielles de notre institution. C'est en ce sens que nous avons établi un registre de dommages résultant de la relation russe. La lutte contre l'impunité est effectivement indispensable pour la construction de la paix. Et c'est en ce sens que nous travaillons ensemble pour que le responsable d'une telle agression soit tenu de rendre des comptes.
Et alors, salue par ailleurs les efforts fournis pour l'élaboration d'un plan d'action du Conseil de l'Europe pour l'Ukraine, résilience, relance et reconstruction, auquel nous avons l'intention d'y contribuer, moyennant une contribution volontaire. Nous partageons les valeurs de démocratie et de multilatéralisme et nous sommes fermement attachés dans l'avancement des droits sociaux en Europe. Pour cela, nous avons déjà commencé les travaux pour la ratification prochainement de nouveaux articles de la Charte sociale et nous croyons qu'une conférence d'autre niveau doit être organisée très bientôt pour donner suite au process de tournant. D'autre part, nous sommes plus que jamais convaincus de l'importance de l'éducation. Nous assistons à un recul démocratique croisant. C'est pourquoi nous insistons sur la participation des gens et soutenons que l'éducation à la citoyenneté démocratique reste le moyen le plus efficace pour combattre les attentes aux droits de l'homme, à l'état des droits et à la démocratie. C'est au sein même de l'institution scolaire que nous devons redoubler d'efforts afin que nos jeunes puissent acquérir les compétences communes indispensables de vivre ensemble dans la société démocratique culturellement diverse et inclusive. L'Andorre se réjouit des négociations achevées pour l'accession de l'Union européenne à la Convention. Nous sommes convaincus que cette réussite extraordinaire contribuera à consolider la protection des droits humains en Europe. Je félicite l'engagement et la volonté exprimée aujourd'hui même par le président du Conseil, M. Charles Michel, et nous les encourageons maintenant à finaliser le processus unitaire pour parachever ce projet commun. Finalement, permettez-moi également de saisir cette occasion pour féliciter les pas franchis par le Conseil de l'Europe en faveur de l'adhésion du Kosovo à cette institution et nous espérons que l'Assemblée parlementaire avancera en ce sens. Pour finir, je remercie l'Islande pour l'intense euh, travail fourni, en particulier pour la préparation de ce sommet et j'adresse mes meilleurs voeux de réussite à la prochaine présidence de la Lettonie au sein du Conseil de l'Europe en lui assurant le plein soutien de la principauté d'Anna. Merci. Merci beaucoup. And now to the Ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you, Chair. Respected colleagues, allow me right on the beginning to express my satisfaction with the excellent organization of the summit, with the friendliness and openness of our hosts. The landscape, one of the most beautiful seen so far, gave us the right to insist on a resolution of environment in which I firmly support you. Bosnia and Herzegovina fully support the independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine with its international recognized borders and condemned the Russian aggression. The presidency of Bosnia and Herzegovina do not have a fully consensus in this matter, but we follow the policy of the European Union regarding our candidate status and thank you, the members of the European Union, for the chance and perspective for the citizens of my country. The sufferings of the civilian population are so tragic that the word human rights unfortunately has no place in this sad war. We stand in solidarity with the suffering of civilians, the destructions of material goods, the devastation of culture and religious buildings, and everything tragic that every war brings. We in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I personally know it very well. I am the opinion that the Council of Europe should be more involved in finding solution to just end of the war and finding a way to the just and sustainable peace. Council of Europe, it is the right place for that. My message to summit be give peace a chance. We support summit declaration with annexes in which creation a lot of effort has been invested. I also support the perspective of young people, especially from Eastern and Southeastern Europe, the part of Europe where the transition, political, economical, civilizational and any other is still ongoing in order to open a perspective for young people in their countries and the stop exodus on the youth to the West. Dear friends, I want to finish my intervention with the wish not to wait for the two more decades before the next summit, but to celebrate sustainable peace at the next one as soon as possible. This will be our task. If we are reasonable, we will work for the welfare of our citizens. I thank you for attention. 
Thank you. And now we go over to uh, the ambassador of France, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Madame la Première Ministre. Excellence, je ne saurais exprimer mieux que le Président Macron hier les enjeux de notre présence ici à Reykjavik et rappeler le soutien fidèle de la France au Conseil de l'Europe, dont nous sommes fiers d'être l'État hôte à Strasbourg, capitale européenne des droits de l'homme, de la démocratie et de l'État de droit. Le Conseil de l'Europe est fondé sur notre détermination à bâtir et protéger un espace juridique commun où prévaut l'État de droit, libéré des atteintes aux droits fondamentaux, à la dignité humaine et à la peine de mort. La défense de ces principes communs est notre responsabilité, en particulier quand l'un de nos États membres est sous le feu depuis plus d'un an d'une guerre brutale d'agression. Notre famille démocratique européenne est aujourd'hui réunie pour réaffirmer son soutien à l'Ukraine. Le Conseil de l'Europe joue ici un rôle pionnier en créant le registre des dommages. C'est une étape majeure dans la lutte contre l'impunité de la Russie. La France est fière d'en être un État fondateur et se tient aux côtés de l'Ukraine aussi longtemps qu'il le faudra. Nous soutenons la déclaration de Reykjavik et ses annexes et souhaitons saluer ainsi l'importance de notre réengagement pour soutenir notre maison commune, le Conseil de l'Europe et sa colonne vertébrale, la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme. Notre communauté juridique européenne est forte parce que la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme en constitue la clé de voûte. Il est indispensable que ces arrêts soient exécutés sans exception. Madame la Première ministre, veuillez recevoir nos remerciements et nos félicitations appuyées pour nous avoir conduits sur le chemin de Reykjavik et du succès du quatrième sommet des chefs d'État et de gouvernement. Notre feuille de route pour les prochains mois est claire et elle est ambitieuse. J'adresse mes meilleurs voeux à la Lettonie et aux présidences suivantes pour sa mise en œuvre. Soyez tous assurés du plein soutien de la France. Je vous remercie. Merci, madame. And now we go over to the ambassador of Italy. Signora Primo Ministro, <laughs> signora Segretaria, Segretario Generale, Eccellenze, desidero per prima cosa esprimere a nome del Presidente del Consiglio dei Ministri della Repubblica Italiana, Onorevole Giorgia Meloni, che non ha potuto purtroppo prolungare la sua permanenza a Reykjavik, un sentito ringraziamento al Governo islandese per la calorosa ospitalità ricevuta e per la determinazione con la quale il progetto del quarto vertice dei capi di Stato e di Governo è diventato realtà e ha conosciuto il successo che tutti noi oggi possiamo testimoniare. Un grande grazie a tutto il team che ha lavorato a questo fine. L'Italia attribuisce una grande importanza al Consiglio d'Europa, ne condivide pienamente i principi e i valori, tiene a che esso possa continuare in modo sostenibile e efficace a svolgere un ruolo centrale nella difesa dei diritti umani e nella promozione della democrazia e dello Stato di diritto. Ancora di più in questa fase storica caratterizzata dall'aggressione della Federazione russa all'Ucraina, cui va tutto il nostro sostegno e la nostra solidarietà. L'Italia è a fianco dell'Ucraina e continuerà a farlo. In questo vertice il Consiglio d'Europa e gli Stati membri hanno dimostrato una volontà comune di reagire e capacità di resilienza. La creazione del registro dei danni causati dall'aggressione russa, cui l'Italia ha aderito sin da subito, è un primo concreto strumento a sostegno dell'Ucraina. I crimini commessi nei confronti dei suoi cittadini non devono restare impuniti. La dichiarazione sui bambini ucraini trasferiti a forza tocca un tasto di umana solidarietà cui nessuno di noi può restare indifferente. Molti altri sono gli impegni che assumiamo oggi con la dichiarazione di Reykjavik e con i suoi allegati. Si tratta adesso di tradurli in azioni. L'obiettivo comune è quello di rendere il futuro più aperto, solidale, rispettoso dei principi e valori fondanti di questa organizzazione. L'Italia considera il quarto vertice del Consiglio d'Europa un punto di partenza, non un punto di arrivo, per costruire un futuro dove episodi come l'aggressione russa all'Ucraina non possano ripetersi. Occorre l'impegno di tutti. Quello dell'Italia non mancherà come confermato ieri al più alto livello politico di governo. I migliori auguri alle prossime presidenze e grazie per la vostra attenzione. Grazie mille. And now we go over to the ambassador of Lithuania. Please. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam President. Excellencies, allow me to thank Iceland for the hospitality and outstanding presidency of the Committee of Ministers. I also wish great success to the incoming Latvian presidency. Lithuania welcomes this summit's strong focus on supporting Ukraine and ensuring Russia's accountability for war crimes. Lithuania welcomes the ag agreement on the register of damage caused by the aggression of the Russia against Ukraine and joins its as a co-founder. My president signed the declaration yesterday. Lithuania also supports the launch of a special international tribunal for the crime of aggression. The situation of Ukrainian children, especially those forcefully deported to Russia, turned into Russian citizens and illegally adopted, deserves our particular attention. We must ensure the repatriation and accountability of perpetrators. We welcome ICC arrest warrants for Putin and Vova Belova. Lithuania provides asylum for 70,000 Ukrainian war refugees. Uh, Lithuania also attaches particular importance to the functioning uh, of civil society of, uh, of Russia and Belarus and has provided asylum to numerous members of democratic opposition, NGOs and media uh, persecuted in these countries. We admire democratic activists, human rights defenders like Svetlana Tsikhanovska present with us today and others for their courage in stepping up for the democratic values. Protection of democratic values as well as rights ensured in the European Convention of Human Rights is an ongoing process. We acknowledge the crucial role of the European Court of Human Rights and the, the importance of the execution of its final judgments. To address the challenges, we must keep our organization fit for purpose. Since Russia has been expelled from the Council of Europe, it is utterly inappropriate for Russian citizens to continue working as staff members in the Secretariat for any reason. We support the removal without, uh, 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 without uh, delay, all of them from all units of our organization. I thank you. Thank you so much. And now over to Norway and to the Ambassador of Norway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Council of Europe summits do not happen often. They only take place at important turning points in our history. The reason for gathering now is that war is raging on our continent. Russia is waging a full-scale war against Ukraine, but this is not just an attack on Ukraine. It is an attack by the Russian autocracy against our European democracies and our values. We will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes, and we will hold the Russian leadership to account for the crimes that they have committed, because making sure that Russia does not win this war is key to the security of all European nations. And without common resolve and unity around our values, we shall prevail. Our European democracies we're not built in one day. We constantly need to adapt and reinvent our democracies to stand up to the challenges we face and new issues as they arise. We welcome the Reykjavik principles for democracy that we adopt here today. It is self-evident that these 10 guiding principles should be implemented by us all. We believe that they can serve as inspiration for countries outside Europe as well. Now, we hear questions about democracy in our member states and whether it delivers for the people. Let me be clear. Democracy does deliver for the people. Our great European nations have proven this time and again since the Second World War, that democratic societies where the rule of law is upheld and where governments protect the human rights of their people, such societies are best equipped to provide peace and prosperity for their citizens. We also welcome the appendix on the convention system. We cannot hide that there are unresolved challenges in implementation of commitments and court judgments in some of our member states. We all need to step up action to improve, no matter how difficult it may seem politically at home. Having political prisoners is, of course, not possible in the 21st century. The Council of Europe has assisted us in upholding our values and in achieving better societies each and every day for the past 74 years. We will continue our steadfast support for the organization and we look forward to celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Council of Europe next year. I thank you.
Thank you so much. And now the Ambassador of Serbia, please. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister, Your Excellencies. Summits of the Council of Europe are held on an extraordinary basis when the Member States decide that extraordinary circumstances require it. This one, the fourth in the history of the organization, is being held in so far the saddest requiring circumstances, the war in Europe between two for Serbia brotherly people. The citizens of Serbia empathize with the suffering and losses of all the victims of this brutal and unnecessary conflict and takes this opportunity to appeal to all those who have any influence on its course to use it in order to end it as soon as possible. In, in the year in which it marks 20 years of membership in the Council of Europe, Serbia, unfortunately, was brought into a situation to consider the further meaning and modalities of its membership. It was brought to this position by the recent decision of the Committee of Ministers at the level of deputies to start the procedure for the admission of the so-called Kosovo to membership in the Council of Europe admission of a part of the territory of the Republic of Serbia. Thirteen member states did not support this decision and seven expressed their explicit opposition to it. In the history of the Council of Europe, such circumstances have never followed decision of this kind, which is a clear indication that it is a controversial decision. It is obvious that a number of countries at their own risk sacrificed unity and neglected the generally applicable fundamental principles in the organization in order to achieve their own political interests and goals. This directly harmful act towards Serbia's vital interests in the Council of Europe raises the legitimate question of what its future is the organization and what kind of damage it can still expect. The unreadiness of a critical number of members to protect the inviolability of the borders of all, and I repeat, all members of the Council of Europe, with the declaration of the heads of state at this summit, led to the Republic of Serbia abstaining from this, its adoption. Serbia thereby distanced itself from double standards regarding respect for international law and the principle of inviolability of borders. In conclusion, I would like to confirm that the Republic of Serbia respects the territorial integrity of Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova within their internationally recognized borders. At the same time, Serbia has an obligation to respect and defend its own territorial integrity, which is why it will not relinquish any part of its own territory. And it is up to the member states to decide whether in the future they will rely on the unity of the organization for their convenience only and selectively interpret the fundamental values or whether we will realize that precedents and deviations from respect for principles lead to uncontrolled international developments, which unfortunately we are witnessing today. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now we go over to the Ambassador of Japan. Thank you, Madam Chair, Your Excellencies. Um, well, uh, uh, as a representative of Japan, I have the honor to deliver a message uh, on behalf of His Excellency uh, uh, Mr. Kishida Fumio, uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, who, uh, who unfortunately could not come here in person. Um, quote. I would like to extend my warmest congratulations on the occasion of the fourth summit of the Council of Europe. I am honored that Japan has been invited to the summit as an observer. Japan shares the fundamental values and principles of Council of Europe, such as human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And as the only country in Asia with observer status, um, we have deepened our cooperation with the Council of Europe. The world is facing uh, multiple challenges, including Russia's aggression against Ukraine and outrageous acts uh, that threaten 
the very foundation of the international order. With the international community at an inflection point, the Council of Europe has an important role in setting rules for the international community. I welcome the establishment of the register of damage caused by the Russia's aggression against Ukraine in preparation for the summit. Japan remains committed to actively participate in future discussions. The G7 Hiroshima summit uh, will take place in two days. At the Hiroshima summit, which will be held when uh, uh, the free and open international community is at a historic turning point, Japan would like to demonstrate the G7's strong determination to uphold the international order based on the rule of law, firmly rejecting any unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force or the threat of use, uh, to, to use nuclear weapons, as uh, Russia has done, let alone the actual use of such weapons. With Russia's aggression against Ukraine being protect, pro, protected uh, uh, in order to end the aggression as soon as possible, we would like to reaffirm that the G7 and the like-minded countries in Europe will remain united in imposing severe sanctions on Russia and strongly supporting Ukraine and demonstrating our solidarity with Ukraine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And now we go over to the representatives of the institutions that are here with us at this meeting. And first is the chairperson in office of the OEC, OSCE, uh, which is also the Minister for Foreign Affairs of North Macedonia. So please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am honored to address this historic Council of Europe summit today here in Reykjavik as the OSCE chairman in office. The summit deliberations and documents adopted will undoubtedly have wider impact on the state of the affairs we are confronted with. Madam Chair, the Council of Europe was born out of the horrors of the Second World War. The OSCE is a child of the Cold War. We both have mandates where respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms, democracy and the rule of law are at the core. Last year, Russia chose to trample on the core founding principles of the OSCE, the Helsinki Decalogue. It was Russia's choice to launch its unprovoked full-scale war of aggression that has inflicted devastating damage on Ukraine. It has visited untold harm and suffering on millions of Ukrainians on a scale not seen since the World War II. Russia's war against Ukraine has undermined the European security architecture. It continues to challenge the entire value and rules-based international system. The consequences and costs of this war of choice are deplorable and unbearable for the whole of Europe, the OSCE region and beyond. However, our choice is to safeguard our shared democratic values and commitments that we were building over the decades through this indispensable net of principles and achievements of the multilateral system, precisely created to defend our future of what the humanity experienced in the past. Madam Chair, alleviating human suffering is the reason for our strong focus on the people. People directly affected by war and conflict fear for their lives and livelihoods. People further afield are impacted by insecurity and uncertainty. That was the reason that we chose the motto, it's about people. It is a driving force for our year as the OSCE's chair. And I'm convinced that the OSCE has a lot to offer to all regions within the OSCE space. We will therefore continue to spare no efforts in supporting a functional and flexible OSCE, offering a versatile toolbox to help restore peace and security, prevent conflict and promote cooperation across the OSCE region, promoting human security through support for sustainable economic growth and environmental cooperation, and upholding human rights 
and promoting tolerance and non-discrimination as prerequisites for comprehensive security. We are also working on empowering OSCE field missions and support overall field presence in coordination also with the Council of Europe partners on the ground. Mm. Excellencies. Thank you so much. Yeah. The time is really up. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> okay, much. Okay, thank you yeah. so much. And I will pass the floor to the Secretary General of the OSCE. OSCE. Madam Chair, it's a privilege uh, for me to attend this very important summit. The OEC and the Council of Europe have built a very strong partnership based on a common commitment to the principles that form the foundation on which secure, sustainable societies are built. As war has returned to Europe on a scale we would not have imagined, and I would just join our uh, chairperson in office who has just underlined it, we see the continued devastation wreaked on Ukraine with terrible consequences for countless women and men, boys and girls in Ukraine, but also beyond. But we also see that working together to support peace and security, human rights and the rule of law is all the more important. The OEC and the Council of Europe are working together to make a real difference in the lives of people across our regions. We work together on reconciliation, including through cross-community trust building. In pooling our expertise and standards, we promote tolerance and non-discrimination across our regions. Trafficking in human beings is an age-old scourge that continues to affect millions of victims each year. The risks have been exacerbated as millions have had to flee their homes in the context of the war against Ukraine. By coordinating regular exchanges between the OEC and the Council of Europe networks of experts, we help raise awareness, improve understanding of the crime, and build greater capacities to combat it. These are just a few examples of the fruits of our cooperation. The needs are great, but so is our potential to meet them together. This summit is an important signal that the Council of Europe and all it stands for remains a priority for all of its member states. And I look forward to our continued cooperation, in particular with the Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And now we pass the floor to the UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, please. Thank you, <clears throat> Prime Minister Jakob Zotir. Excellencies, to safeguard the human rights of more than 650 million people in 46 countries. The mandate of the Council of Europe is far-reaching and it has been transformational. But today there is both light and shadow over Europe. Our world is experiencing a resurge of war and conflict accompanied by inequalities, deprivation and injustice. Like our Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights details the lessons of Europe's history. They map the steps that walk societies away from disaster. We need to unite around these values and rebuild that foundation. In this 75th year of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we must strengthen justice and equality, bringing legal protections fully to life in people's day-to-day -day reality. We need to rebuild trust with accountable governance and a free civic space so that everyone can participate. We need to respond thoughtfully to new challenges, including digital and environmental threats. I welcome your discussions of possible new legal frameworks on the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment and on artificial intelligence grounded in human rights. I ask you to work with our year-long Human Rights 75 initiative that is underway and to make concrete pledges for transformational change. The SDG Summit this, December, this September and the Summit of the Future in 2024 can help put our world back on track to a joint, just, inclusive and sustainable future. The Council of Europe can be proud of its achievements across a range of rights, and we look forward to deepening our partnership with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now the President of the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of Council of Europe. Thank you, dear President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. 30 years ago, 
the first summit in Vienna decided to endow the Council of Europe with a second political assembly, the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. Today, all local and regional authorities of the continent are represented by the Congress in the Council of Europe. They contribute to the anchoring of the fundamental values of the organization at the level closest to the citizens. Through them, the intergovernmental work carried out by the Council of Europe is firmly rooted in the life of local and regional communities. As shown daily or in crisis situations, local and regional representatives are on the front line responding to the needs of citizens. In Ukraine, they have acted as a second civil army in the resistance against the full-scale aggression by the Russian Federation. Today, we welcome the establishment of a register. The Congress will be proud and committed to helping make the register work. Local and regional authorities play a major role in building democratic stability in our communities. And they also play a crucial role in Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, as two-thirds of the SDG targets can only be implemented at the local or regional level. We call on you, the heads of state and government, to seize the opportunity of this summit to express a strong and renewed commitment to grassroots democracy. With your support, we are ready to better respond to democratic challenges by strengthening the Congress monitoring of the situation of local and regional democracy, expanding the observation of local and regional elections, and enhancing the protection of human rights in our communities. Dear Excellencies, the Congress will actively implement the decisions of this summit within the realm of its competences. We will contribute to the democratic security of this continent and its citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we go over to the President of the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you, Chair. Your Excellencies, on behalf of the European Court of Human Rights, I'd like to thank you and your delegations for the tremendous work undertaken on the road to Reykjavik. Today you reaffirm your commitment to the European Court of Human Rights and to the Convention as the ultimate guarantors of human rights across our continent. For some of you, the beating heart, for others, the backbone. The Convention system provides for shared responsibility. It goes without saying that the primary responsibility for ensuring compliance with international legal obligations to which your states have sovereignly committed is borne by your domestic democratic and judicial systems. You also recommit today to the binding nature of our judgments and decisions, to their timely execution, and to ensuring the efficient functioning of the court through the provision of sufficient and sustainable resources. At no time in the history of the Council of Europe have your resolve and these commitments been more important. Firstly, in the exercise of its residual competence in relation to the Russian Federation, the court is ensuring that a former contracting party cannot evade retroactively its international legal obligations under the Convention. Individual and inter interstate conflicts cases are being dealt with as a matter of priority in the only international court currently seized and at the merit stage. Secondly, for over 60 years, the European Court, your court, has dealt with well over 1 million applications and handed down almost 26,000 judgments. Those judgments have saved lives, transformed thousands of others and contributed to the bettering of our societies. Indeed, it is through the judgments and decisions of the European Court that the values underpinning the Council of Europe and the democratic principles to which you subscribe today find concrete expression. There is no doubt that the Convention has proved an essential bulwark in times of conflict. But its value lies, too, in its equal application at all times to all states, old democracies and new, in defence of our common European values. Rule of law backsliding, attacks on judicial independence, gender violence and inequality, the erosion of effective political democracy, pluralism and tolerance are not ills befalling other states. They are ills which the Convention is being used to tackle across all Council of Europe states, your states, whether before domestic courts or the Strasbourg Court. Thank you. Respect for human rights is a legal obligation, but their defence and the defence of those charged with ensuring the law is respected 
are also acts of politics and diplomacy, acts which require political ambition and courage. I thank you and Iceland and her enchanting people. Thank you, thank you. Then we go to the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Secretary General, Presidents, Ministers, Excellencies. Russia's war in Ukraine is the negation of all the values for which our organization stands. It is also a tragic epilogue to years of total disregard for agreed human rights standards and also a cautionary tale of what can happen when a state completely disregards international law and order and the common rules established to guarantee international peace. The pursuit of justice and accountability for those responsible for the terrible human suffering and destruction caused by the war should remain a priority for our organization. In March, I carried out my second visit to Ukraine since Russia's full-scale invasion of the country. The visit focused mainly on the issue that most of you mentioned, human rights of children who have been separated from their families or legal guardians and transferred to Russia or temporarily occupied territories uh, of Ukraine. In the observations I issued after my visit, I called for an unimpeded access to be given to records and information about all affected Ukrainian children. And we will continue to work on this. The emphasis on supporting Ukraine is both right and necessary. It is also crucial that it does not translate, including inadvertently, into a loss of focus on ensuring respect for human rights in all our member states. Focus must be maintained on addressing human rights backsliding and the erosion of democratic and the rule of law principles. The centrality of the convention system to this endeavor cannot be overstated. The execution of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights needs to be more systematic. There are many areas where this should be done, countering attempts at weakening judicial independence and impartiality, ensuring the safety of journalists, facilitating the peaceful expression of opinion, including during public protests, addressing the human rights dimension of an environmental degradation, and crucially ensuring a human rights compliant response to migration movements. Thank In you. this connection, the generous response rightly given to Ukrainian people fleeing the war should hopefully, hopefully make this task feel more just than daunting. Some authorities have proposed and adopted the laws that violate established human rights standards and the basic principles of human dignity. This is a dangerous path, and removing cornerstones from the edifice of the international human rights law runs the risk of others falling until the whole edifice collapses. We need to conclude. The role of the Council of Europe is as crucial to the future of Europe as it was when it was founded more than 17 years ago. Member States must remain committed to its founding principles and values, and putting them into practice is not only your legal obligation, it is also the only way to pursue the goals of these organizations. Thank you so much. We go to the Governor of the Council of Europe Development Bank. Right? Madam Prime Minister, no, no. Excellencies, no, um, this was, okay, no, it's okay. Uh, yes, I? Please, yes, yes, please. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Prime Minister, Excellencies. I'm honored to participate in this historical summit, reaffirming the values of human dignities and freedom at this critical juncture. The Council of Europe Development Bank, the SEP, is the social development bank for Europe. Established 67 years ago, today its social mission is more relevant than ever. Refugees crises, climate emergencies, the COVID pandemic, and lately the brutal Russia aggression against Ukraine are among the many challenges that the SEP has been able to help tackling with rapidly and effectively by financing projects with a high social impact. As we prepare to welcome Ukraine as our 43rd member state, 
I would like to call on other members of the Council of Europe who have not joined yet the SEP to do so, thereby heeding exhortations of the Parliamentary Assembly. Why join? Because the SEP finances projects that boost social cohesion and self vulnerable people, promoting the values of the Council of Europe across all its activities. In Ukraine, for example, the SEB will deploy its resources to invest in social sectors, including health and housing, in line with the Council of Europe Action Plan. Looking ahead, the SEB will remain faithful to its mission, proud to support its member states to address pressing social needs, leaving no one behind for a brighter, more, more prosperous future for all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Now I got a little bit mixed up on the speakers list. Next is the President of the Conference of International Non-Governmental Organizations of the Council of Europe. Now it's your turn. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me start with reminding us all on a lesson we all are taught by Ukraine every day today that a strong civil society is the best protection for a democratic country. It is its vibrant civil society which is the backbone of Ukraine's resistance against Russian aggression. And this lesson learned, we should all value a strong, vibrant civil society in all member states of the Council of Europe. And through the Conference of INGOs, we enable the Council of Europe to reach out to this civil society in all member states. Therefore, Singer should be seen as a necessary partner to enable the Council of Europe to achieve its aims, including much needed better visibility and engagement with people. It represents participatory democracy, it brings grassroots experiences, and it can ensure that the Council of Europe's work is focused on civil society priorities. Therefore, I expect that Member States will commit to strengthening the role of the Conference of INGOs in the Council of Europe, invest more in its development and work. We have linked up with many players in civil society across Europe to strengthen the role of the Council of Europe in response to the urgent challenges we face. The Russian aggression, the onslaught of anti-democratic and anti-liberal ideologies on our value-based societies, the aftermath of the pandemic crisis, the environment crisis and the threats of climate change, the need to move away from fossil energy sources, to combat inflation, rising inequality and social injustice and unrest. We are ready to do our part with even more energy and commitment. And in the same spirit, we expect renewed and active commitment to the values and mission of the Council of Europe from all member states and more commensurate funding that will enable pressing work to be done across our continent. The Council of Europe is the preeminent body created to build a democratic and human rights-based peaceful society in Europe after the catastrophic Second World War. It is the institution which helped the transformation process after the collapse of the Soviet Empire. And today it is the value-based pan-European institution that carries the flame of hope in a world where once again democracy, human rights and the rule of law are challenged. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last on the speaker's list, President of the European Commission for Democracy through Law. Madame la Première Ministre, Excellence, la Commission de Venise, depuis sa création, œuvre pour défendre et promouvoir la démocratie, les droits humains et l'état de droit. Elle a contribué à la formulation, au développement et au respect des standards du Conseil de l'Europe qui concrétisent ces principes et à la promotion d'un patrimoine constitutionnel commun en Europe et au-delà dont l'agression de l'Ukraine représente la négation. Et ces dernières années, la Commission de Venise a pu voir que des acquis démocratiques ont été malmenés notamment à l'occasion des crises, qu'elles soient économiques, sanitaires ou sécuritaires. Il en est ainsi notamment en matière d'indépendance du système judiciaire, pourtant le marqueur fondamental de l'état de droit. Il en va de même pour la liberté d'expression. Des avancées en, matière, en faveur des droits humains sont contestées, concernant notamment le principe de non-discrimination. En outre, nous sommes aujourd'hui confrontés à de nouveaux défis, qu'il s'agisse de l'urgence climatique ou de l'utilisation de l'intelligence artificielle. La Commission de Venise, organe consultatif indépendant et impartial unissant 61 pays, s'efforce toujours d'être réactive et de trouver dans un dialogue inclusif les voies d'une conciliation entre les standards portés par le Conseil de l'Europe et les spécificités des ordres juridiques nationaux 
Ceci afin d'assurer, dans un contexte donné, la viabilité des solutions proposées pour les constitutions et les lois en cause. Toutefois, ni la diversité des traditions juridiques, ni les crises ne peuvent être un obstacle à la mise en œuvre des standards et au respect des obligations internationales, notamment de la Convention de sauvegarde des droits de l'homme. Pour exercer sa mission, la Commission de Venise doit bénéficier du soutien et de la confiance des États, car aucune solution juridique ne peut aboutir sans volonté politique. Et ce sommet témoigne de l'engagement individuel et collectif au service des valeurs qui inspirent la Commission et au soutien de l'espace juridique commun dans lequel la Commission de Venise s'inscrit. Merci de votre attention. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I am sorry for the strict time management, but we are finishing nearly on time. And thank you all for being so wonderful in actually respecting the time limits. That is not a given. So thank you so much. A few and very short final remarks. Um, because we are approaching the end of the summit, and at the Reykjavik summit we set out to do two things, to strengthen our support for Ukraine in its defensive struggle against Russia's aggression, as well as to take concrete steps to address accountability for war crimes, and to recommit to the fundamental principles of the Council while also seeking to motivate it for future challenges. And Given the diverse makeup of the Council's member states, it does not come as a surprise that it can be quite hard to agree on a common conclusion with respect to complex, complex and complicated issues. By being true to our values and principles, our diversity can be a source of strength. And such a commitment is also a testimony to a common will to fulfill the Council's original goals and to maintain its political rele relevance in dangerous times. So, dear friends, I want to thank you for your dedication over the past two days. We will not be judged by our words, but by our actions, and we can be proud of the outcome document, but of course, our work continues. And now it is time to transfer the presidency of the Committee of Ministers from Iceland to Latvia. So before concluding the summit, I will hand over the chair to my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Iceland, Thordis Kolbrun Reykjör Gilvadóttir. Please, Thordis. Thank you, Chair. Madam Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, Europe is united around Ukraine. This has been true from the moment Russia launched its brutal full-scale invasion last year. Today, we reaffirm that this remains true. It can be argued that the war in Ukraine is a horrific manifestation of a widespread and long-lasting conflict about the kind of world we do want to live in. Malignant forces all over the world try to impose their will by offering cheap solutions and emotional appeals. We know that a society where people are free to think and free to speak is not easy to manage. But defending free societies is worth the effort a million times over. Today we reaffirm our commitment to a society of individual freedoms. We recommit to our belief that a liberal democracy based on respect for the rights of the individual is the form of society that has created the greatest human welfare and economic prosperity in human history. The challenges we face all have a common solution. The solution lies in our humanity and in human creativity. By committing to the Reykjavik principles for democracy, we are showing that we are united around our values. Dear colleagues, since we assumed the presidency, we have taken our role seriously. We are proud to have been able to contribute to this organization and to the cause of democracy, human rights and the rule of law by offering Reykjavik as a venue 
for this fourth summit of the leaders of the Council of Europe. When this idea was first floated in Torino, one year ago, almost to the day, I said, if we are entrusted with the responsibility of hosting a summit, we will perform it with humility for the task and pride in our opportunity to be of service. I believe that the timing is right and that Reykjavik can serve as a meaningful venue to reaffirm our commitment to the values that we must cherish and defend. The high-level participation of the Member States truly demonstrated and demonstrates our common commitment to this organization and its role in safeguarding our common values. More than 40 countries have already joined the Register of Damage that will be set up as a part of the process of ensuring accountability for Ukraine. Most believe the process for establishing such an agreement would take years. It has taken less than six months. This shows what can be done when political will and determination are united for an important cause. This shows what we can do together. So I would like to thank all of you for attending and I would like to use this opportunity to extend my thanks to all of those who have contributed to the summit in so many ways. I also wish to thank my permanent representative and team in Strasbourg and the Secretariat for our cooperation throughout the presidency. My heart is truly and honestly full of uh, gratitude to so many people who have made the summit a reality. I would like to offer the Latvian presidency and my very good friend, uh, Edgars, um, the assurance of our support in the important work ahead in implementing the decisions made here today. These are times of turbulence and uncertainty. As my prime minister said in her statement this morning, we have been here before and we know this story has many possible endings. These are serious times and serious times demand serious discussions. We, the people in this room, can affect the outcome, we can make a difference to how the story ends. It will require courage, it will require wisdom, it will require humility, and it will require leadership. We need to advocate for our values and maintain support for them within our societies. Europe must remain united around Ukraine, and we must remain united around our values. Thank you. Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, this is definitely the last speech of this summit. <laughs> First of all, so. <laughs> uh, only if I'm going to provoke any debate. <laughs> but first of all, let me thank the Icelandic presidency for hosting this summit. Iceland has shown efficient leadership of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, as well as the efficient organization of this summit. I'm honored to address you today as Latvia assumes presidency of the Committee of Ministers for the next six months. It will be our second time chairing the work of this organization since Latvia became a member in 1995. Latvia undertakes this task with a great sense of responsibility at a critical time. The Council of Europe was founded to protect democracy, human rights and the rule of law. For almost 75 years, it has greatly contributed to the rules-based order in Europe. The international rules-based order has been fundamentally challenged by the Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine. Democracy and human rights are the bedrock of freedom and peace in Europe. They must never be taken for granted. I welcome the Member States' strong commitment to protect standards and values of this organization. Latvian Presidency's work will be guided by the decisions taken today at this first summit of the Council of Europe. As the Presidency, we will work closely with other Member States in order to strengthen the Council of Europe. We will open to a dialogue on all issues of the agenda. Excellencies, Latvian Presidency will advance the implementation of decisions in support of Ukraine. Today, 
we have reconfirmed unwavering support to sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine. The Council of Europe must continue support to Ukraine and its people as long as necessary. We condemn in the strongest terms Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Such a behaviour can never be normalised. Russia must comply with its international obligations and withdraw its forces from Ukraine, as well as from Georgia and Moldova. We must ensure comprehensive accountability. It means responsibility of Russia as a state for violations of international law. And it means individual liability for the most serious crimes of international concern. As Presidency, we intend to keep these issues high on the agenda. Russia must pay for the damages caused by the war against Ukraine. I welcome the first practical step towards future international compensation mechanism, the establishment of the Register of Damage. Latvia is among its founding members. As the Presidency, we will advance its operational launch. An establishment of the Special Tribunal for the Crime of the Aggression is a vital further step. The crime of aggression is a leadership crime and the source of other crimes committed by the Russian armed forces against Ukraine and its people. This accountability gap must be closed. We retain our position for establishing an ad hoc international tribunal under the auspices of the United Nations. Latvia condemns the deportation of Ukrainian civilians to Russia or its temporarily occupied territories of Ukraine. The practice of the forcible transfer and unlawful adoptions of Ukrainian children is especially worrisome. I welcome today's decision to focus on the situation of the children of Ukraine. I call on Member States of the Council of Europe to provide support to the Action Plan on Resilience, Recovery and Rebuilding of Ukraine. Latvia has just provided a financial contribution to this Action Plan. This organization must continue supporting the efforts of the Belarusian society to build a free and democratic Belarus. Excellency, <clears throat> let me now turn to national priorities of our presidency. Firstly, strengthening democracy and the rule of law in Europe, including promotion of the execution of the European Court of Human Rights judgments. We will devote particular importance to the rule of law through an effective functioning of the justice system. In September, Latvia will organize an informal conference of European justice ministers in support of resilience of Ukrainian judicial system at the time of war and post-war reconstruction. Latvian presidency will explore the role of national courts in the execution of rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. We will emphasize the need for a dialogue-based monitoring process over the execution of the judgments. It can be done by greater cooperation among states and with experts from the Council of Europe. The Presidency will address the crucial role of education and youth promoting democracy and the rule of law at the Standing Conference of European Ministers of Education in September. Secondly, Promotion of freedom of expression, safety of journalists and digital agenda of the Council of Europe. Latvian Presidency will join efforts with the Council of Europe to promote the protection of journalists and media professionals, including during conflicts and wartime. In October, we will welcome you in Riga at the International Conference on Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists. On this occasion, the new Council of Europe campaign on safety of journalists will be launched. The Latvian Presidency is committed to contribute to the work of the Council of Europe in the area of artificial intelligence. We support the negotiations on the new framework convention. Thirdly, advancement of reforms of the Council of Europe. The current geopolitical situation provides an opportunity for changes of the Council of Europe as the organization. The summit has given us policy direction in this regard. Latvian Presidency is committed to increase the transparency, visibility and efficiency of the work of the Committee of Ministers. The civil society and youth must be involved in the policy discussion processes. The situation 
when citizens of Russia continue working in the Council of Europe structures is unacceptable. We will work and we will follow up on this issue at the Committee of Ministers and with the Secretary. In conclusion, I assure you of the Latvian Presidency's commitment to human rights and equality. We will promote and protect the values and standards of these organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Two things. The Secretary General will host an official lunch, which will take place in, uh, after five minutes. Uh, I think that's a good news for all of us. <laughs> and number two, dear friends, I declare the fourth summit of the heads of states and governments of the Council of Europe, the Reykjavik summit, formally concluded. Thank you. any questions but just a couple of words this is really huge and important event to ukraine uh, since we've done quite a lot of job internally we are in the process and already confiscated quite a lot of russian assets on the territory of ukraine we also confiscated assets belonging to russian oligarchs and top level officials who supported aggression and from those assets, from proceeds from those assets, we created internal Ukrainian compensation fund and started payments for uh, those who suffered from aggression. And to that purpose, we also created local Ukrainian register for damages. Right now, uh, it's sort of replication this practice, but on international level, on a much broader scale. And we consider this to be a first important step in the longer process. So since we will register, we'll, we'll collect data on all the damage uh, uh, 
done by Russia on the territory of Ukraine, and there are there will be next steps. The second step would be to create compensation commission, which will consider claims of different legal entities and national persons, and will distribute. Well, we will consider what claims are justified, and the third step would be to create compensation fund. Uh, filled uh, by Russian assets and uh, redistribute money to those who suffered from the aggression. So those three major steps and we launched the first one. This is kind of a great uh, first step and we have quite a long road ahead, but still there is a hope. So everyone understands that it would be meaningless just to stop at the stage of the register. Okay, we collect the data, but what's next? Next would be payments. And naturally, given the amount of damages uh, and amount of people suffered, we understand that it's not really honest to put the burden uh, for rebuilding Ukraine and paying compensations for Ukrainian taxpayers or European taxpayers. Russia shall pay. So no doubt with that. Give. We have some assessments of the direct material damage, and now this, those calculations are confirmed by the World Bank, and we are talking about hundreds of billions of US dollars. But if we take into account personal damages, if we take into account damage to ecology, damage to municipalities, to businesses, we could easily calculate even now uh, the, the amount close to one trillion, and this money is too huge to be paid by taxpayers. Russia shall pay. That, that is our message in terms of economic uh, consequences. But there are others also discussed here, like creation of tribunal. Everyone understands and recognizes that Russia made a crime, committed a crime, crime of aggression, and Putin is personally responsible for that crime. Uh, each lawyer uh, who studied international humanitarian law understands that all the criteria uh, for the war to, to uh, be recognized as a crime of aggression are met. And, well, that could be quite an easy case for any court. But Putin, Shoigu, Lavrov are protected by immunity as, uh, as a head of the states and ministers. And Ukrainian national court could not hear the case against against them for the crime of aggression. And ICC, International Criminal Court, could not do this as well since Russia did not ratify the Rome Statute. So ICC doesn't have jurisdiction over that crime, though ICC has jurisdiction over other crimes, war crimes, and they issues, issued arrest warrant for Putin for other crimes. But crime of aggression is a separate. So we still push for creation of a tribunal, and this is also one piece of the broader mechanism for responsibility for what Russia has done on the territory of Ukraine. And uh, it's a huge work which needs to be done by lawyers. And well, we could celebrate first success, but more work is waiting ahead of us. So this is a kind of a short description of what are our plans, and if you have any question, I could answer that. Are you optimistic, the government of Ukraine? Are you optimistic of, of huge uh, progress in the counteroffensive uh, this year? <laughs> we we uh, usually in Ukraine right now we made a joke that uh, like any Ukrainian citizens ought to have to give interview or media comment on what he regards as counteroffensive, when it will happen and what will, would be the steps. This is an area of responsibility of our military. They will decide when and how uh, conduct counteroffensive. Everyone knows about, the, uh, about it, that it will happen, uh, but uh, it's supposed to be unex unexpected. So you will never hear the timing, the place, the venue, or whatever. Those details are covered naturally uh, by uh, the military secret regime. Uh, how would you describe the situation in Ukraine right now? It's difficult. Uh, missile shelling intensified significantly. Uh, we, like, 
half a year ago, a couple of months ago, we had shelling of the Kiev yeah, once in two weeks. But right now it happens sometimes each night, sometimes uh, one in time in two days. So uh, it, it really intensified. Uh, and most probably this is a reaction for uh, 